Ed's going to. Ed, did you, Ed, did you want to? Uh, Ed, do you want to kick us? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, we'll get uh, we'll get started. Uh, people uh, straggling in. Uh, Jerome is running a little late in traffic, but he'll be here. Uh, we're told he's on New York Avenue somewhere, uh, coming in from Baltimore. Um, and but welcome to um, the second day and. Um, we're going to try to connect. Uh, uh, this was kind of like uh, when I was uh, an undergraduate student, the professor would say, for the first half of the course, I'm going to tell you we're going to get to that. And for the second half of the course, I'm going to tell you we already covered it. And you're never going to be able to tell when that happened. Um, and, but today, we promised to tell you um, the, the back end of what we were promising yesterday, which is uh, how do we try to uh, add to supply um, and connect the dots on a lot of the things that um, uh, we were uh, presented with uh, yesterday as the challenges and the, and the holes in our supply. And the purpose of this first panel is to um, try to figure out some of the solutions to that. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Judd. Uh, before I get started I just and introduce the panel, I really want to thank Ed and Lynn and Steve, Tobias, and all of you for putting together this conference. Uh, you know, as, as uh, someone at Wells Fargo where we are pretty active in the housing market, uh, one of the things we really appreciate about this conference and AEI and the perspective um, is that you really understand kind of the complexity of this market and how broad and how many different stakeholders and groups there are and how something that affects one of them has the potential to impact the entire system. And so I think yesterday we saw a tremendous amount of um, interesting presentations but also interesting perspectives about where there might be risks in the system and how we can think differently about those and better understand how the whole system can be strengthened and develop policies in that regard. So thank you for that. Kind of to, to just pivot a little um, to introducing this panel and why I'm so excited to kind of be a part of it is, is that, like Ed said, this is where we talk about the solutions. And for us at Wells Fargo, we've historically been really active kind of on the demand side and more in thinking about the role of capital in the housing finance system and primarily focused more on mortgage where we're starting to increasingly recognize, as, as Mark Fleming said yesterday, that this is just one housing market. It's not just homeowners and there's not just renters, but it's one market. And us as a community bank, we've been hearing increasingly loud um, voices from our communities that housing affordability is the driving issue for them. You know, yesterday several different panels talked about this is a national emergency. And I think we are, we're hearing that as, somewhat, as a, an organization that has a strong federal component, but also is banks, individuals that are in communities where they're facing, you know, a growing share of their income being spent on housing that's impacting their ability to invest in the things they're interested in, consume other goods, spend, uh, spend on their kids and their education. And so we're really starting to expand our perspective on policy and how can we, as a kind of a national to local um, participant in the housing market better understand our, our role and what we might be able to do um, moving forward to help increase supply and to better serve kind of the entire housing market rather than just particular components. So with that, I'd like to introduce, I think it's Jason first, um, and we'll hear about some of the really cool things from the manufacturing world in terms of how we can drive down costs in this very kind of tight labor market um, to just drive a lot more housing. So. Turn it over to you. Thank you very much. There we are. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, having me here. Um, I am a Texan, uh, but I love the chance to get away to cold weather, and I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> so I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Icon. We're based in Austin, Texas. So the big idea at Icon, and kind of what gets me out of bed every morning, is what if it, it is 2018, what if you could download and print a house in 24 hours in for half the cost. What kind of problems would that solve? What kind of world would it create? And what kind of opportunities would it open up? That's sort of the big provocative idea. My original background was in conservation biology. I've been working in housing for about a decade. So ICON was started as a, sort of along those reasons. We're a construction technology company that's using robotics, software, and advanced materials to re-meet and reimagine a basic human need, which is shelter. Because home building has not changed in 1,000 years. And that is kind of crazy when you put it that baldly. But literally, when we, ever since we figured out how to plane lumber 
in kiln fire bricks. It's been sticks and bricks ever since with slight variations on the theme. An unchanged paradigm for 1,000 years. We figured out how to mass produce screws and nails in the Industrial Revolution. We figured out power tools in the middle of the last century. And with all that innovation, we started popping out shopping centers and Taco Bells as fast as we could. And we think um, increments and iterations on that theme have gone as far as they can, and it's time for a big revolution. And after a long research project, um, we settled on 3D printing as the most potentially disruptive paradigm. It's kind of crazy that a disruption hasn't happened yet because housing is the largest industry in the world. As, you know, I'm kind of preaching to the choir at this conference. A lot of people are surprised to hear that, but it is the most valuable thing most people own or have access to, and everyone has to have one. Uh, it's surprising in that regard that all the investors I know love to disrupt large undisrupted industries, but it hasn't happened yet. It is a tragedy, and again, preaching to the choir to the people in this room, because we're moving to a world in which, number one, the average person cannot afford a home. And that is exactly backwards if you care about a world of freedom and equality and these sorts of things, right? There, there once upon a time was a world in which a landed few owned everything and everyone else owned those people, owed those people money uh, just to exist and live. And, and we've tried to move away from that world. Um, number two, sustainability. I said I was a conservation biologist by training. The reason I got into building in the first place is because if it turns out if you triage the world and you say, where in the world are all these ecological and human health issues coming from, the surprising answer is building. Buildings are the number one user of energy by sector. It's not the gas guzzling SUVs. It's not the private jets. It's buildings. Um, number one user of renewable and non-renewable resources. Number one producer of landfill waste. Number two user of water. Of water by sector is buildings, unless you consider water use and energy production, then actually buildings use more water than agriculture. And I want to let that sink in for a second. It is existentially urgent that we find a way to shelter ourselves without ruining the world. Um, and then finally, supply. Even if we had solved number one and number two, there's, we simply aren't building enough houses of a high enough quality fast enough. After the you know, kind of 2008, 2009 timeframe, a lot of people in this room already know a lot of builders decided the view wasn't worth the climb and moved on to another indus other industries and haven't come back. And so these are civilization, existential, civilizational kind of existential challenges um, with a revolution in housing at their center. And so the promise of 3D printed homes compared to any other paradigm, and at first this was a hunch, and, and I think we've validated this now, but number one, 3D printing is faster. Um, we 3D printed a house. Um, in 47 hours at quarter speed, I'll show it to you in a second, which means at half speed, we could have printed it in 24 hours, and at full speed, we would have printed it in 12 hours. Within five months, we will be able to print a 2,000-square-foot house in less than a day. It is lower cost. Um, the first house we printed, the print cost on that house today is $2,000. That's just for the print. You still got to put in on windows and roof. We can fully deliver a house in America for about 30% lower than low-cost housing. Our goal is to be 50% less within the next 18 months. Customizability. Um, a really exciting theme that a lot of people heard about for a while was prefab and modular housing. The problem with that model is two things. Number one, the, the financials work really good if you're within 500 miles of the factory. Number two, you need to get 100,000 people to want the exact same house. And for whatever reason in America, that's been a non-starter. With 3D printing, if I 3D printed 1,000 houses in a row, all 1,000 can be different without changing the cost structure Absolutely, at all. It's just a digital design file. Also, curves and slopes are just as straightforward and easy as a straight plumb line, so you can really open up some cool design possibilities. Usually, uh, my grandfather from East Texas used to say, there's almost nothing in the world somebody can't make a little worse and sell a little cheaper. Um, and that's kind of what we've done with housing. Um, but with this, in, in this case, you go faster, cheaper, and you get something better. Concrete is one of the most resilient materials known on earth. So hurricane, flood, fire, mold, you name it, um, this is the most widely available uh, resilient building material on earth. Um, because we site print, that's something important to understand, we don't print these things in a warehouse and ship them. We print on site. You get what's called a continuous thermal envelope, and because of the high thermal mass of concrete, you actually get a more comfortable, more energy efficient, uh, lower maintenance cost building as well. So these are better buildings, faster and cheaper. Zero waste. Uh, some of you guys, I'm sure in this room, have been to a construction site. Usually there's more waste than house, it seems like, when they finish the whole thing. With this, you print what you need to the drop, and then you stop. When we finished printing our first house in Austin, um, we had one wheelbarrow left of waste, and that was mostly from cleaning out the machine when we were done. 
Uh, and that was the first, that's as bad as it's going to get. That's the first one. Uh, and then finally, industrial scalability. Usually in conventional building, a guy's idea of speed is, man, I got a framer that can go, he's half the time as the other framers. It's like, man, your, your framer is not scalable. Like, I'm so sorry. Um, with this, it is a simple, we know how to mass produce cars. We know how to mass produce phones. We know how to mass produce a lot of things. This is a repeatable, scalable s- solution to these problems. We think there's a lot of opportunity for this. You know, affordable housing is what we're going to talk about a lot today. Uh, but we think about middle market and high-end housing a lot as well. If you could imagine a world where a home that looks like a million-dollar mansion is actually $500,000 for this printer, a home that looks like a $300,000 house in Austin, Texas, we could actually sell for about $150,000. And so it's bringing design and dignity within a range of more people in the world. And finally, government and space, we're talking to some military agencies, as you can imagine, about application for military buildings. Uh, We just got top 10 in a 3D printing challenge with NASA because NASA thinks we're not hauling two by fours and screws to Mars when we go, that you need a machine that doesn't need oxygen or food that you can remotely control and spit out all kinds of buildings. And so um, this is a disruptive paradigm is what I'm trying to tell you. This isn't a niche technology, just like the two by four is a paradigm. You can build a shack, you can build a mansion. This is a new paradigm of building and construction, and it's not vaporware. Our first customer was doing, trying to build housing with dignity in the developing world, and they wanted to know if we could could help them, and we said, yeah, you know, imagine a world where we are literally printing a new house per day, and then you have people moving in, and every day a new house pops out, and somebody else gets to move in. And so that was our first customer. Nothing focuses the mind of a startup like having a paying client, and that was really awesome. Um, We had a choice whether to sort of build this house in a cow pasture um, outside of Austin, Texas, or to build it in Austin, Texas. We decided to build it in the city limits and to go through a very rigorous engineering and architectural design process. We went to the city of Austin and said, hey, guys, we want to 3D print a house. We want a permit for it. And as we say in Texas, at first they looked at me like a cow staring at a shut gate, but eventually they got their head around it, and they gave us a list of things we had to do to prove to them that this thing was safe and ready to be lived in. We accomplished those things. We went through a series of, not a, a long series of tests And this, I think, is one of the most important building permits in the illustrious history of building permits. That is not uh, an era of formatting of your technology here. That's how the city of Austin hands out building permits. Uh, But I think that's the most important building permit ever produced because that is the first permit in America for a 3D printed house. And that house is standing in Austin, Texas. And people are in it right now as we speak. I'm sure they're drinking their coffee. Um, this house was meant to be a prototype of the kind of house we would deploy in Central America with, a, with our customer. One of the coolest things that happened at South by Southwest when we unveiled this house was the number of Americans who walked up and said, man, I'll take one of those. How much for that? Uh, we fully delivered that house for about $10,000 to our customer. It doesn't have HVAC because it was um, ready for Central America, but fully delivered that house fully delivered and ready for America would be about $25,000. It's a 350-square-foot house um, because that's the size the client wanted it. But the first-generation printer can print up to about 1,000 square foot houses. Our Vulcan 2, our second generation printer, as we call it, will be printing 2,000 square foot houses in about five months. That's the printer. That's another view of the house. That's the inside. You can say it was not finished. And we have now, since then we finished it, we've put in a shower, HVAC, ceiling, sort of all the things that you would expect in an American home. And since we unveiled that, we have had over 1 million houses requested And several thousand printers requested. So I've been busier than a one-legged man in a butt-kicking contest trying to figure out what to do next because we only have one printer uh, and we're trying to develop a better one. Uh, But it's been very exciting. So the world said a big yes to this technology. They said a yes to its speed, a yes to its cost, and a yes to its aesthetics, all of which were like really exciting for us. So now what for us? Um, We are lining up other projects. Almost all of the projects we have lined up right now are international. So we have projects lined up in... Mexico, El Salvador, Dubai, and Egypt, and we are looking for American partners who want to invest in the future of this technology. Like I said, we'll have a printer capable of printing a 2,000-square-foot home in less than 24 hours in about five months. Um, We are developing more concrete formulations to work in multiple uh, climate zones, um, and we really, you know, want to take the next step with this technology. We're looking for partnerships and looking people to looking to make people aware <clears throat> that the future is here. This isn't like, you know, flying cars are almost here and, um, you know, what, whatever futuristic thing you can imagine. This is not vaporware. This is state of the union today. It works uh, and we're ready to build houses. And that's me from Icon. Thank you.
Tough act to follow. Great job. Thank you. Uh, so I'm up here. Tom White's here. Uh, we've been working together two years ago. We had a conference on economical housing by design. Um, we've been working on trying to bring that uh, to fruition. Um, in the interim, I actually uh, worked on a development uh, down in southwest Florida. Uh, got it through the zoning process in three or four months, which was record time. Had NIMBY opposition, as uh, Raven here, and, um, and it, from these little group of homeowners uh, or, um, that just were against it just because it was not something they wanted in their neighborhood, even though it was a mile and a half away. Um, but we got the zoning approval, but it failed uh, to get some other support to uh, turn the city council uh, uh, to some extent, and we couldn't get the rest of the support we needed, so we had to abandon it. Um, but we have a design, and we have a, a cost structure and an approach, um, but it's difficult to get things through um, the, the process, the local uh, process. So Tom and I are going to uh, combine, talk about these things, uh, what we've learned and, and what some solutions might be. Um, we're going to try to connect the dots from yesterday. We had the density issues, the lack of density. Uh, by the way, I mentioned that there's um, uh, in Palisades Park, New Jersey, where I grew up, uh, had about 12,000 people when I grew up there. and It was all single-family, one-unit homes. And I go back, and I see the house I grew up in is now a, a duplex or two two side-by-side -side house, two houses side-by-side. -side. I guess they're called semi-detached. And didn't think too much about it, saw a few others, and then I looked up the population in Wikipedia, and it was 20,000 people. I said, well, wait a minute, how did it get from 12 to 20,000? So then I searched some more and found out there had been 1,500 or 2,000 of these one-unit one buildings torn down and replaced by two-unit. How did that happen? The zoning said you can build one or two on the same lot. Uh, units and so all of a sudden, this is uh, literally a mile and a half from a mile from the George Washington Bridge. Perfect location. Cut the land cost in half when you do that, roughly. Um, so uh, Lynn talked about the uh, construction has moved away from middle-income uh, renters. We, you'll see some evidence of that at the local level. The per-unit development cost that Ed talked about in terms of LIHTC is extraordinarily high, and we'll talk about that. <laughs> And uh, along with the crowd out provision, which I can testify to personally, um, in uh, with LIHTC, uh, two properties that I've been looking at in uh, Manatee County, both of them ended up uh, uh, with LIHTC developments, and they can outbid anybody because they get all this money from the federal government. Uh, and the locality says, hey, I don't care that this is going to cost $200,000 to subsidize. That money's coming from the federal government for the most part. I'll take mine, and you, know, you go do whatever you want to do. Uh, so it, there's a lot of reasons why this is so intractable. Um, the uh, presentation will show why, instead of focusing on affordable rental housing, which Ed you know, covered very well yesterday, we should focus on economical rental housing, not requiring subsidies and relying on market forces, and certainly you know, 3D printing and robotics and some other things might be you know, certainly a part of that solution. Government policies have made developing economical rental housing basically illegal. You just can't do it. Uh, we talked uh, actually yesterday about the costs of, uh, where was that one? Um, I've got one more. Oh, yeah, the multifamily cost of construction. I'll talk about that a little bit. We've added all these costs, um, and the price of land has gone up because we've basically zoned things so that they can, you can only build a relatively small number of units, and that drives up the cost of the land. Uh, and in short, voters and taxpayers, uh, as voters and taxpayers, we've misused this political process. There was a lot of talk about that yesterday. Uh, we've made it much too expensive to build. We used to be able to build this stuff uh, economically and for a broad range of, of uh, uh, population incomes. Lynn talked about that yesterday. So if we had done the same thing in the auto market, no one could build and sell a car for under $40,000 today. But we have a vibrant, working, new and used uh, auto market, if Lynn were to do those same charts, and we actually did one that showed what's the price of a new car versus the price, uh, the, the, the wage, the uh, median income of a household, and it's unchanged for 50 years. Um, so that, te and that tells you that that's a market that's working. They're responding to uh, the supply and demand, and there's only so much money, and so they have to build cars that people can afford. So we've done a bad thing. We've done it for reasons that people thought were good things, but it just ended up with a bad outcome, which is what we talked about yesterday. 
So service and light uh, production workers make up from 30 to 50 percent of the total workforce in most markets, 39 percent nationwide. The next slides I'll go through quickly. There's a lot of information. It were, these workers earn between 22 and 28 thousand dollars. We're not talking about teachers. When I say 39 percent, no teachers in there. Teachers' aides, yes, no teachers. We're not talking about policemen. Uh, dispatchers, yes, policemen, no. Uh, we're talking about people that you, you know who they are. They work in hotels. They work in retail. They work in restaurants. They're line production workers. Uh, they're you know, bank tellers. They're all of these things, that, and they make an average of twenty-two dollars to $28,000 a year. And it doesn't vary much whether you're in Los Angeles or you know, somewhere lower cost. Uh, the housing is different cost, but the, the wages are not too different. Why is that? Well, if you're a department store, you're selling the price, things for the same price in, in L.A. as you are anywhere else. If you're McDonald's, you got the same dollar meal or value meal, whatever, everywhere. Um, this is a huge group of workers. Um, you can't possibly have enough subsidies to bridge this. Ed covered that yesterday. So we have to figure out how we use the market to do that. Um, so this is the MSA comparisons that show you, you know, Los Angeles, the country, uh, uh, Sarasota, San Jose, uh, and along the bottom is the cost of renting, and along the y-axis is what the incomes are. Um, in um, slide five, we talk about only 5% of the apartments currently uh, uh, target this group. It actually, is a type of a 17%. So we've got the existing stock, and this kind of complements what Lynn covered yesterday. The existing stock of um, apartments uh, is 25% for luxury and middle, uh, about 57% market rate moderate uh, at moderate rents and affordable by subsidy about uh, 18%. New construction in 2017, 63% luxury and middle, 17% uh, moderate and 20% affordable. That's that area that Lynn showed when she had the deciles uh, spread out. Uh, Manatee County, uh, county I mentioned, Bradington uh, as part of Sarasota metropolitan area, uh, 50, over 50% 50 of the jobs are in service, manufacturing, and logistics categories. Again, these are the jobs that are making uh, uh, twenty-two dollars to $28,000, those occupations on average. Uh, this is where the manufacturing jobs are, healthcare, retail, government, et cetera. Uh, and so that's where the demand comes from. The demand comes from the jobs. Without the jobs, there wouldn't be people living there. Um, and so you have to start with where the demand comes from. Uh, where's the supply? And so this is... Uh, from the American Community Survey, where we show where the supply is, and it's color-coded by um, the, the price of the rents. And you can see there's a lot of light green or green up in Manatee County, less so in Sarasota, which is somewhat higher income, except in the bottom uh, part of the county. And then Charlotte County is another area that's uh, relatively uh, uh, lower priced because it's lower income. Uh, finding affordable housing close to work is challenging. This is uh, just a, a chart out of a recent, very recent August report by Freddie Mac uh, that shows how difficult it is for renters, particularly what they call essential workforce versus all others. It's just very difficult and fairly difficult, 48%, to find affordable housing close to work. Why is that important? The cost of commute is huge when you add it to all the other costs because the, the rental cost is really the combination of the rent itself, the utilities, um, and the cost to commute. Those all have to be looked at as the package. If the cost to commute can be lower, then uh, your package just went down. Or you could afford to you know, pay a little bit more and live closer and not have the commute. So what happens? Why does this happen? Um, the filtering process is supposed to work. It works slowly in housing, but it works not at all. And I think uh, yesterday was it, somebody mentioned 500 years it would take to, to, for this to happen. So this is 1949. Um, Richard Radcliffe uh, wrote a book on urban land economics. Uh, the application of principles of land economics is the key to fashioning a solution. The lack of low-rent housing is basically a result of the inherently costly nature of housing. It's not economically feasible to build and operate new rental properties under a rent scale that's within reach of low-income families. That's just sort of a given uh, at, the, at the moment. Again, maybe uh, uh, 3D printing can solve that, but at the moment, that's a problem. That's been a problem for decades and decades and decades. Uh, you can't build that with market uh, uh, rents. 
On the other hand, the number of units that can be released in the filtering process, which works well in the new car industry, which filters down to used cars, we're used to filtering in all kinds of things, even you know, iPhones filter today. So we're used to a lot of filtering. We're just And housing filters down, but it filters down incredibly slowly. Uh, and why is that? Because the number of units that can be released for filtering at any given level of the market is limited by the filterable surplus we'll have on the building activity. If you only build at the high end, then A, there's not enough demand up there, um, and that's what uh, Radcliffe says. And once that demand is filled, and we're seeing it in places like Denver, where you build a lot at the extremely high end, and then all of a sudden you have a surplus at the high end. Now, that will filter down some, but then you have to stop building at the high end because there's just not enough demand. You, you still haven't dealt with the issue of how do I fill in that space that Lynn talked about yesterday. And so, again, Ratcliffe said it's very clear. You have to build in the middle range. You can't build in the low range because that's too expensive without subsidies, uh, or it's not feasible without subsidies, and subsidies are incredibly expensive, and you can't build at the high end because there's just not enough demand. There's huge demand in the middle. We used to build in the middle. We stopped. We have made it illegal. Five immutable laws of expanding the supply of economical rental housing. One, developers don't pay the cost of construction. Tenants, too, do. All of these things, the cost of regulation, they're not costs on the developer. They're costs on the tenants and the home buyers. In this case, multifamily, but the same thing for single family. That's who's paying for these. The developer's not paying for them. If zoning and building codes mandate expensive housing, it will be expensive. Uh, economical housing isn't economical if transportation utility costs are too high. Newly built economical units must compete with the stock of older market rate rentals and subsidized rentals and alternative uses for the land. It has to end up being a market uh, result. And supply can't expand unless new economical rental housing is allowed to be built. If you don't allow it to be built, you can't get any. Uh, so this is pretty simple. We have to get the cost of producing new apartments down to a point where they can be economical to entry-level workers. Otherwise, it won't be functional for these workers. End of story. That's the, that's the challenge. Autos. I already mentioned this. You know, 17 million new cars a year. Prices range from 13,000, 70,000, 40 million used cars. It works. Um, and it's been working for a long time. Uh, if we hadn't screwed up the rental housing market, there'd be lots of new apartments renting below $1,000 and lots of old apartments renting for well below $1,000. But as Lynn showed, we started screwing this up 30, 40 years ago. So we have a long way to go to make up for it. Here's uh, the auto market uh, showing the, the relationship between the average cost of a new car and median income. And you see this is a compressed scale. It all ends up around one it's actually lower than one today, um, but it ends up uh, going back to 1967. So we're talking uh, 50 years, and it barely has changed. It's gone up and down, but it's all around one. Uh, new construction, real, home house, real house prices relative to real construction costs haven't stayed the same. Uh, the real construction costs have been going up with inflation. They haven't changed. They've actually gone down a tad. But home prices have gone up tremendously, and these are the this is the tax that... Uh, our policies basically impose zoning and, and the, the uh, land use and, and the, the code requirements and everything else that impose on building uh, housing that drive up the cost relative to. And so since we don't have a real manufacturing process, there are lots of requirements on cars, um, but we have uh, figured out ways of manufacturing that through mass production and, and adding in all kinds of things at a low cost. Cars today are much, much better and much safer, but we've still kept it within that same range because we haven't changed the sort of the basic approach. We've added expense, but we haven't been able to figure out how to address the resulting issue. Densities of 14 to 20 units were commonplace 25 to 40 years ago. I just went and looked at a bunch of developments and found that these densities were available uh, back uh, then. And this is in uh, Bradenton, Manatee County. And how many units they have. It's illegal to build this today. These are still units that are still serving people today. Um, the federal government, when it builds subsidized housing, they're probably on their second or third generation of that house, of that, those apartments. They've been built, torn down, built, and torn down, uh, rehabbed, and they're you know, still pouring money into it. These were built 30, 40, 50 years ago, and they're still uh, providing housing for, um, uh, for individuals. Government housing solutions haven't solved the problem. We've talked about this. I'll just uh, keep moving. Focus on expanding the middle third. Renters, by definition, have below median incomes. 
Why? Because homeowners, by definition, have above median incomes. And you're either a renter or a homeowner. So if the homeowners are above, the renters are below. And um, this is from Manatee County. The middle third is at 50 to 100% of AMI. But as Ed pointed out yesterday, that's not the group that gets helped by the uh, affordable by subsidy uh, uh, programs because they're helping people at 30 AMI and, and below largely. Uh, and those aren't the people we're talking about that actually are the workers who are making the 22 to $28,000 in a household and maybe work making 25 to $50,000. They're not the people that uh, uh, these affordable by subsidy programs particularly help. So you have to target this middle third. You have to align economic interests at a local level, which is really you know, hard to do. Uh, you need cost-effective land use regulations, higher density, reduced parking, reduced local regulation and cost, expedited approval processes, right-sized and waived fees and taxes. You need developers who are interested in taking advantage of these things to reduce costs through economical design. You need some employers to step up, and you need maybe some help from some private social service agencies. Um, so you, you have to add to the supply in the middle third. That frees up supply for the lower third. Some people that are in the lower third uh, that actually can afford a bit more are going to move out of that, move into the, uh, the new supply, and that will free up a unit in the lower third. Um, that's how the filtering happens a lot faster. Um, the, you must compete with older rentals, which, like used cars, cost less, so you have to figure out how to uh, do that. Uh, that can be a challenge. Uh, you need to have rents, and I have some rent uh, targets here. Uh, what the rent target needs to be, $825 uh, for a one-bedroom. Uh, you need to have economical designs. Uh, and one of the features that I'm trying to implement is uh, reservation agreements with public and private employers of service and production workers. Tom was going to talk about this. One of the challenges of any approach is Immediately, the government wants to start saying, well, you have to have income limits, you have to have this, you have to have that, you have to have this. And all of a sudden, as soon as you do that, the thing swings to being subsidized housing. Um, and the whole point here is you're, you don't want to have subsidized housing. Um, and so this reservation agreement with employers is one way to do that. We know the employers are employing people who are these line production service workers. Therefore, by definition, they're the exact employers that you want exact employees that you want. So be satisfied with that and see how it works. And Tom will talk about that a little bit more. Uh, meeting the challenge in Banatee County, I basically said to the local uh, commissioners, uh, well, do you agree you have a problem? Uh, you need all these new units. How many uh, acres do you actually have zoned with enough density to build multifamily housing? The answer was, and that's not in a flood zone, the answer was zero. You can't solve the problem if you have zero land that's available. So if the zoning and building codes mandate expansive housing, it will be expensive. So the solution is to provide enough rental, enough zoning for multifamily that you could build, say, 5,000 units so that we're not all divide, uh, chasing the same pieces of property. You need a, a bunch of land that can be zoned. Think of that uh, Palisades Park, New Jersey example. They basically said... A two unit is the same as a one unit. Just have at it. They didn't say which houses got changed. That was based on uh, market forces. Uh, so scarcity to sites, uh, current affordable housing policies. Um, they have income limits. They have rent limits. You can't do market housing with income and rent limits. Um, and then you have the regulatory and other costs. Uh, so conclusion, the current affordable housing policy, I think we've learned, is misguided, ineffective. It can't possibly solve the problem. Uh, we've systematically used zoning and building code requirements and other controls and development to benefit existing homeowners with the undesirable side effect of making rental housing too expensive for wage earners too far from uh, their homes, uh, or excuse me, too far from where they um, uh, are employed. They basically move out until they qualify for the rent. They, they can afford the rent, but that could be 20 miles from where they work. We need to pay attention to current and new workers and their employers, and this requires a fundamentally different approach of allowing economical rental housing to be produced without a, a subsidy um, and making it legal to build again. With that, pass it along. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, Jerry Smalley, the CEO of Blueprint Robotics. I'm also the rookie that doesn't understand Washington traffic. So uh, <laughs> for, for, for that, I apologize. So Blueprint is a um, manufacturing startup located in Baltimore City. Uh, 
employing a European technology that uh, both on the hardware side and on the, on the software side that uh, produces manufactured uh, housing, uh, building components, I should say. If you build it in lumber, we can build it. Uh, so we're, uh, whereas housing is a, a dimension of what we do, it's not the only thing we do. Uh, our, our whole fo focus here at Blueprint is that we're looking for a better way to build. We, we think that in the combination of the, the regulatory environments today, the, which, I, which I applaud in, in, in most respects, uh, the considerable inefficiencies in the, in, the, in the building business, particularly in the wood building, uh, the lumber building sector, the, the uh, challenges to labor, and a need to simply bring higher quality and, and, and um, improve pre precision to the building process. And I, I, I'll, I don't have the thousand-year data that my colleague has, but I, I will certainly say that there hasn't. It's 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 fair to say that there hasn't been a significant innovation in after the Civil War. So it's been a while. Um, we just simply think there's a better way to build. When you look at when you look at the the um, uh, comparative industries over the past 25 years, automotive, uh, aerospace, uh, medical, every, all of them have made draft, drastic efficiency improvements. At the same time, I think it's fair to say that the, the timber-framed industry has actually gone the other way. So who we are, it's an off-site building system. Uh, again, we, our, our technology, we're making a, a big market bet, that's for sure, but we're not making a technological bet. This technology has been in existence for more than 35 years in all of Western Europe. Um, I'm, I'm uh, a dedicated patriot, but I, as, I will criticize us as a people that we often don't look to see what the other guy does. And in this case, they're doing it better. They simply are. Uh, our, our core technology is uh, computer numerical code, CNC. So it's nothing particularly special. It's just an application that happens to be particularly precise. Uh, and we live in the world of private equity, so we are totally funded with private equity, market equity, uh, and the, proud to say at this moment we have no debt. I don't say that every day, but today I will. So we, we actually closed on our equity at the uh, end of March of 2015. We completed our first production plant in uh, October of 16 and started commercial operations in, in March of 17. So it's been quite a uh, little rocket ship here as we, we proceed. At this point, we've produced about 200,000 square feet of product. Uh, it, uh, the, the product we sell, we have no designs, we, we, and we have no design limitations. We only build what our customers want us to build. So our customers are, are the trade, builders, architects, general contractors, and developers. Um, it's very important to say that we don't have any design limitations, but we really cheat. We don't build in vol volumetric modular, but rather we build in a polygon. Everything can be dissected into, or, uh, into a polygon. So it, it, it's important that it, it brings us a lot of, of important um, advantages, per, uh, particularly transportation. Uh, everything we, we build, we ship on a 53-foot flatbed. So there's no permits required. It's a, it's a it's, you know, we, look, we look like the UPS trip, truck going down the road, except we're blue. Um, it, it, the, uh, the, again, it's uh, anything in lumber is, is our product. And our, today we, we uh, operate from basically Northern Virginia to Boston. Our value proposition, superior precision, higher quality materials, a fixed price, and I would add a fixed schedule. When you can, when you can, there's a slogan in the in the building industry. It's that you can quality, price, and schedule. You get two out of three. We'll give you three. We it it it, it is the the benefit of an industrialized approach to what has inherently been to this point an off -site, an on site activity is that you can predict, you have certainty. You have certainty around what you're going to build, what you're going to, what it will cost, and, wh and when you can do it. Significant if, if one is 
really taking into account the entire cost of the, of the construction cycle. This is, um, in general, we're, we, can, we can produce most products in 50% of the time installed on our customers' foundations and 50% of the time normally required. And again, on a predictable schedule. From the very beginning to the very end of the process, it's our engineers that, that consult with our customers to, to produce the, the, the engineering required of the product. We produce it in our plant. We deliver it with our, our equipment to our customers' sites, and we install on their foundations all the way through elect, uh, rough in electrical and plumbing terminated to the local public utility. To our, our first plan is a 200,000 square foot facility uh, just just north of the tunnels in, in Baltimore. We're actually, as history would allow, we uh, occupy a former building pad of uh, GM. The robotics are um, made by a company by the name of uh, Vyman. It's a subsidiary of Homag. Uh, Homag is the largest producer of, of uh, uh, wood processing, timber processing uh, machines in the world, located just outside of Stuttgart. Uh, the, the benefit of the, of the process is it allows us to bring a lot of new materials to the, to the exercise. Uh, so we, we use a lot more engineered lumber. Uh, we use a, uh, a lot more finger-jointed lumber. We use, a, uh, you see here in this, this photo, it's, this is a dense pack cellulose insulation that now, we now have rated for uh, fire assemblies. Um, it, it is, um, when, when you're in an industrialized system, you can reach further to, to innovation. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big plus in what we do. Uh, from an employee uh, base, we are uh, able to, uh, over 70% of our employees come from the city of Baltimore. Um, it is, we're, we're able to, to largely take a, uh, a, a great set of eyes and a, and a, and a uh, motivated person and make them become a technician. Uh, we ship, again, standard vehicles. This is a typical site. This one happens to be on Nantucket, which was... Uh, Provided its own logistical challenges, 35, 35 uh, flatbeds that had hit the hit the uh, uh, ferry just on time, where you you missed the diet, and then you went over hours. So it was it was quite an operation. The product does best in repetitive environments because you're leveraging the systems. That is to say, you're leveraging the front end engineering as well as the the installation. Um, but it it can be anything. It really is. We have no design limitations, and we have no, no designs of our own, which is very important. We're a, produ we're a producer of our customer's product. Our details are more intricate than others, uh, we, and this is just because we can simply be more precise. Uh, I've, I've given more than 600 tours of the, of the, the facility to uh, People from the industry, and I, I take great, and I've, I've had the privilege of doing this uh, with both Tom and Ed. And I have the privilege of uh, saying to them, "I'm going to show you a wall you can't build." And in our, this industry is full of bravado, so I kind of take relish in saying that. And it, and to the person, they can't build a wall. We we cheat. We use uh, robots, but the, the result is breathtaking, actually. And I say that as an engineer. We know more about a, a plan than most of our customers know about the building. That is to say, the dimensional, dimensional integrity for us is defined as three millimeters. That's not exact, that is not a broadly held concept in the construction industry. Uh, this is a, a site in Philadelphia. Uh, we, uh, 26 townhomes through drywall in less than four months. It's not quite this fast, but it's getting there. <laughs> you can see that the everything's delivered in a panel format. 
and we one of our biggest challenges is that we shoot our customers foundations and uh, we've learned that the, the concrete trade is not everything it, it hoped to be so the product itself is exterior walls are include windows and windows and doors custom, custom to the our, our customers needs the, the wall itself is includes electrical and plumbing infrastructure, uh, fire protection as well. Um, floor systems are open web joists. Insulation, as I said, was is dense back cellulose. And at the end of the day, it's watertight. Uh, we, we can t today we can produce about twenty eight hundred square feet in an eight hour shift with twenty two people. Um, and we can assemble that in a, uh, about uh, 800 square feet a day with six people. All our crews on site. So we control it from front to back. We are not the, the uh, solution to affordable housing but we certainly are, are a, a dimension of the solution. The ability to predict cost, predict schedule, improve quality, and have no design limitations is a significant opportunity. And that's, that's Blueprint Robotics. Thank you. Good morning. I like to stand up as a uh, former politician. I like to be able to look around the room and see everybody uh, more easily than sitting. Uh, and by the way, uh, in the spiel I'm going to give, I'm going to give some background, but uh, as we were going through the presentation, I once was on a company who did a lot of international work for uh, aid um, in housing. And the problems we had we in identifying the land use that we could actually attribute to an owner to build a house. So that a lot of the problems, as you probably will find out, uh, don't have to do so much with the construction. They have to do with actually identifying the site and obtaining legal clearance for it. I once went to Turkey to talk about uh, the formation of a secondary housing market in Turkey. It just didn't work. They had no concept of what it takes to have a mortgage market. They built houses over time, the, uh, floor at a time. So much different. And um, Jerry Smalley, by the way, is a bit modest. He was on the board of Enterprise Investments with me. So he has a long history in actually working uh, to see if we can't develop more affordable housing in this uh, country. And, of course, Ed and I go back to the Michigan State Housing Development Authority. How long? 74. 44 years. <laughs> back in my salad days. Right. I think you were thin then, too. No, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> uh, I wanted to just start off, uh, change the tone a little bit. I want to start off with some personal history and caveats. My age, I've lived through the history of most federal housing programs. Uh, my personal housing background includes my first four or five years um, in a 1939 FHA house that was developed for the union workers in the uh, uh, state of Michigan, the city of Detroit. Uh, from five to 16, I was in a four-family flat uh, that was about six, 700 square feet, two bedrooms, uh, and with the noise of the coal-stoked furnaces that had to be stoked during the middle of the night, and you could hear everybody who walked down the steps in that four-family flat and threw the coal into the furnace. As an adult, I've lived in urban renewal high-rises, small apartments in the inner city, large and not-so-large houses in the suburbs, and frankly, on a boat without a land home for several years. And by the way, boats are made out of concrete, too. So there's another aspect of a printable boat. Sounds interesting. Um, I'm a market person. I want skin in the game. 
Um, some of the things I will say later might suggest that I'm against rent seekers, but frankly, I made my living in the game. I may seem to disparage certain agencies, but not the people or their commitment. I've worked at HUD. I've labored to establish a state housing agency that I created as a legislator in the state of Michigan. I was the first executive vice president of the National Council of State Housing Agencies in Washington here. Spent time on Wall Street creating trading opportunities for our desk in, in uh, the company I was with. And with Larry Dale, I created the current framework of the multifamily program at Fannie Mae, which is the largest probably in the world, created the DUS program. We also created the secondary market guarantees for the billion dollar deals that uh, are currently being done. I was on the board of major housing investment companies, including Centerline, when it owned more affordable housing interests than any other company in the, in the country could, could claim to be the number one owner of affordable prop of any pro real estate properties in the, in the country. Uh, and I've been on the housing investment arm of the aforementioned Enterprise uh, Foundation with Jerry Smalley, where we were focused on affordable housing, low-income housing tax credits throughout the country. Going back to the state housing agency, uh, when Ed and I were there, we wanted to allow the developers to do well, but to do it right. When I arrived in the Michigan legislature, an older Irish politician by the name of Fitzpatrick told me his operating philosophy, give a little, take a little, leave a little. Maybe crude, but translated to public policy, don't mortgage the future generations, allow public-private partnerships to take a little, and give value to the current generations. And that's the strategies that I think we're trying to propose in what we're talking about here. Uh, I happened to have a conversation with the head of the Baltimore Zoning Enforcement Board the other day, and he suggested do the right thing, but do it right. So many people try to do the right thing, but they don't do it right. Moving to the slides now, where I will, let's see, where am I, right there? Dance, yep. Hmm? You're going the wrong direction. Brother. Wrong direction. Yep, gone, yep, well, yeah. I've done that before. <laughs> <laughs> These slides are a little bit complicated. You've all heard during the last few days about the lack of supply. Uh, by the way, I grew up when I went to uh, uh, in production programs. Uh, we, we were always focused on production, whether in the state housing agency. When I went to FHA and worked for Larry Simons uh, in the uh, late 70s, uh, that's when we developed the real production programs at FHA that uh, converted Section 8 from a voucher program to a production program uh, and uh, built, I think, more housing then than we have uh, uh, at any other time. But most of the programs that we have now tend to drive up costs to make it unaffordable to the income group that Ed has mentioned, uh, those service workers, light, and, light industrial workers, et cetera, uh, who make twenty-five to maybe $50,000 a year, and I think his statistics uh, uh, showed it better than what I can hear. And according to GAO uh, and housing economists, such as Ed Olson here, uh, the low-income housing tax credit program, unfortunately, is grossly inefficient and expensive, a sinkhole cost, and doesn't actually reach the lower or modest working family. And I think working is important. Uh, maybe some other people here also believe that, but there are some people now who are stressing programs that don't require work. I, I think work gives dignity and is an important fundamental of a society. Uh, Ed, Charlie Wilkins, uh, and I have cooperated on several papers. We've always argued that any kind of government housing program or government programs in general are dangerous, and they tend to get out of whack. They get carried away, uh, and they become enormously expensive and don't accomplish the good that they set out to do. Um, and that's true of student loans and colleges, 
tree farm subsidies we just read about in the paper, uh, and housing subsidies. Um, so that whatever we do here, by the way, we don't trust ourselves either. So anything I'm going to talk about in terms of a new program has a hard five-year sunset with real review built into it because most of the programs don't have an actual process for seeing if they work. Later, we all run around and try to get grants to see if we can study, uh, but then we're looking for dead data. We, can't, we don't have a true system of actually reviewing the programs to see if they are successful. We'd like to build that into anything we do here. And in the next couple of years, starting right now, uh, you're seeing, whoop, I've got to change the slides. Don't I? Where am I at here? We're, we're already seeing the beginnings of the presidential election, much less the midterms in a couple, uh, in a, less than a, two weeks. All the Democratic senators with presidential aspirations have a housing proposal. In fact, one, I think, costs $500 billion. Um, and I, I mean this without criticizing the people who I probably know who built the programs for these senators, by the way, the people at the, uh, uh, on, the, on the left that I know, know well, worked with, uh, are all well-intentioned and fully capable uh, of designing something that looks good on paper. But I'm a practitioner and I'm also, over the years, a student of what goes wrong in these programs. And I think they're much too complicated. They tend to uh, have the idea that the, uh, all programs should start with the lowest income. That was, if any of you remember Cushing Dolbear, the real guru of the affordable housing movement, she was always lowest income first in the National Housing Coalition. Well, I personally don't think that's morally superior because I think that you need to put some resources into areas for the working poor also, going back to what I was talking about before. So that uh, many of these programs will create the same barbell effect that was in Lynn's presentation. Low income, high income, and nothing in between. And the same filtering problem that Ed mentioned. Another thing that really irritates me is the fact that in many communities, they'll put 20% of the units with a bonus density uh, gift to the developer, they'll put 20% into low-income units and say, oh, aren't we wonderful? They, they are breaking their arm, reaching around to pat their back. I, I just think that that's not sufficient, that these communities have to accept the responsibilities for what they've done. Our proposals will support concept, my right page now, um, may be hard politically. And I think the hardest is the first thing. Let local government face their complicity and accept responsibility for exclusionary zoning and fees. I was reading something the other day, or maybe it was even in this conference, that someone was mentioning that many of the zoning, or a lot of the zoning concepts locally, were designed, frankly, to keep black people out of certain neighborhoods. So that... Uh, it's, it's sort of like a lot of the, um, or most of the early gun control was to keep guns out of the hands of black people. So that uh, um, this is a tough nut to crack. Somebody said yesterday it's maybe not well organized at the federal level, but local communities are very well organized at the uh, local level to oppose any kind of suggestions that we're making. Um, quickly, um, we would suggest using vouchers for lower income people. And there's a lot of problems in that because of the lottery effect. And we haven't thought it through completely. Um, anything we suggest again is going to require that local governments uh, in the state 
uh, <laughs> I got five minutes, uh, produce a, uh, a, a program that incorporates the toolkit by uh, Firth and Hamilton at George, George Mason, yeah, the university. Data, data center, yeah. Yeah, as a part of their response. Um, and then we are suggesting a low-income home tax credit. And cutting through, I've got less than five minutes, so. You can take five more. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the, uh, both of the multifamily and the single-family programs are based upon a concept that is totally different than what most programs have been based on as we've gone through uh, these housing experiences in the federal and state governments. To make things more affordable, we've stretched out the mortgage term because it just looks better. You pay less if you have a 40-year mortgage, then you have a 30-year mortgage, and you have a 20-year mortgage. When we look at that, though, if you can shorten the mortgage term and you can buy it down, you can create enormous equity for both home buyers and in rental housing uh, ownership. Uh, the rental housing side of it, it doesn't immediately come clear, but one of the things that has happened in all these subsidized programs is that we build it, and then we don't take care of it, we don't have reserves, and then we have to give it new subsidies. So the entire 236 program, virtually, that Barney Frank froze and from reselling, and it was a private taking in the end, but... Uh, that's now where low-income housing tax credits are often going. We had a whole group at one of the companies I worked with who did nothing but take the old low-income housing tax credit, uh, take new low-income housing tax credits and figure out how to use it on our 236 investments. Uh, it's a lot to supply, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, so that, um, again... Uh, on this chart, you see that we have um, a five-year sunset. I've, I've got to keep repeating that because I, I think that it's important to always check on what you're doing, and we've never learned how to do that well. Let's go to the, the uh, Lift Home Tax Credit Program. Now, the trick here that we're trying to do is to build modest, affordable housing. That's what FHA did initially. That's what the 236 program did initially, unlike Section 8, which built Taj Mahal's. So we're going to try to limit this to 80% of median income, long term, less than 20 years. Uh, the gyrations on how you figure out the debt to income and the uh, ability to repay, I'll leave that to the mortgage people in the, in the room. Uh, but the credit must be used to buy down the interest rate for at least five years. And the uh, uh, concept is to increase affordable housing in single-family, newly constructed homes uh, less than 1,800 square feet. Now, that's a totally different approach. Uh, it's been used before, actually, in early uh, HUD programs, uh, FHA programs, really. Uh, but the advantage of doing this is that you have a modest housing, you have modest housing production, and take a look at what happens to a zero down payment program compared to current 3% down 30-year programs over time. You can see the wealth building implications because you have the buildup of equity in the home by the homeowner. And that has all sorts of ramifications in terms of credit risk. We've got a slide later which shows the uh, superior performance of 20-year or less loans compared to 30-year loans. And some of that might be self-selection, but a lot of it is you've got the equity because what we've seen at least in many, many situations, and what I've seen over time, is that a furnace breaks down and the homeowner has nowhere to go because uh, they don't have any money. They're already stretched to the breaking point. But when you have built up some equity, you have some borrowing power to go back and to correct the problem with your home 
and, and still be above water. Quickly, I'm just going to read the top top chart because the rest fill in the blanks. But if for 6.25 billion a year, we think we can get 525,000 first-time home buyers, uh, and many of these would have produced, would have bought homes without the credit, but that we can uh, actually build up over time, over 10 years, five million low-income. First time home buyers placed in the path to a wealth building mortgage. And you can see all the caveats we have in terms of taking into the fact that realistically some people would have bought housing anyway, blah, 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 blah. But uh, we think that this could result in a 2% increase in home ownership rate, all in the low, moderate income, affordable uh, uh, sector of the uh, housing market. Another interesting thing, if you can build in this market, is you take people out of lower rental situations, put them in the house. What do you have? A new affordable housing rental unit that can fill in the gaps then for other people who are in the uh, 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 low-income market. Next slide is a slide you can read at your leisure, it's complicated, but it basically argues that these are safer loans, and I've mentioned that before. Uh, moving on to the multifamily, using the same concept, uh, shorten the mortgage term, create a subsidy for an upfront interest reduction, cap the cost of the housing, we're capping it at 100 and um, uh, 50000 as you'll see later, with the primary credit going to $125,000 development cost or less. I think Ed said that the recent GAO study of nine states that were pretty well economically integrated had about a $216,000 development cost per unit. Uh, it, this translates to about one-tenth the cost of a low-income housing tax credit uh, unit, and about one fifteenth the co one fifteenth the cost when you consider all the subsidies that have gone into making low income housing tax credits successful with no risk to anyone. There's no skin in the game. Um, we would focus on new construction, except uh, allowing substantial rehabilitation and opportunity zones, which is a newly created uh, zone. Uh, that is still really developing uh, in terms of its programs. Uh, the eligibility requirements. Now, this is where it gets tricky. We don't want to over-regulate. We want to create a market test. We want to put real risk in the game. We think that developers are very clever people, actually, and that they will respond by, by actually, in their competition, creating a, a better unit than what you could believe for the cost that you're putting into it. Because they know that they have to take the market risk of renting to someone, uh, even if they're lower income. They're not being fully subsidized for everything. So that we're trying to work through concepts about how you can do that without creating rent limits and without creating income limits, uh, and without these other things. And we have some ideas here in terms of limiting the square footage of units uh, built, of tying uh, the financing of these units or the credit to the ability of a developer to go out and actually talk to governments and employers about th these workers that Ed mentioned and tying those uh, uh, employers to these projects with set-asides uh, not at a cost, but at, a, at, a, at an agreement that uh, uh, these units would be available for their workers. Uh, again, this is conceptual still. We need your input, too, about how you can try to develop a supply program that doesn't over-regulate, leaves skin in the game, uh, and, and allows the market to work.
quickly, um, I think I've, yeah, uh, $1.7 billion a year gives us 100,000 newly constructed units uh, and 20,000 in opportunity zones. These, of course, are our projections if we can make a program that is actually a market program. Quickly again, uh, this is a busy chart again, but you can see that currently the amortization of a 30-year loan over seven years is, three, uh, after 15 years, is $338, where if you have a 20-year loan bought down for the first seven years, it's $692. That $692 means that you can recapitalize a multifamily property when it needs improvements without seeking more subsidies and still keep in the same market zone. It's, it's, a, it's a concept that takes a while to, to understand, but if you can create this kind of housing, it's not going to go somewhere else. It's 1800 you know, it's limited in cost. It's, it's, it's not designed to become the next co-op or the next condo in a high-income area. Uh, it's not even because of the cost limits. You couldn't even build it for the yuppies in New York. I guess yuppies is an old term. <laughs> uh, so that what we're trying to do, again, is to create supply, and supply that will immediately be available for filtering because it doesn't have to filter far. It is already in the ballpark for one-third of our employees in this country. Um, and again, we're tying it to states being willing to adopt the um, development toolkit to incent additional housing supply, which is a political tough one. Uh, but the, I won't go through these, but you can see that one is with expanding by right housing development, so you have, don't have to go in for zoning. Um, second is reducing the cost of development by cutting back on some of the fees and requirements of local communities. And third is to expand use rights in existing building stock. Uh, with that... I thank you. I hope to see you again. I hope to uh, see both uh, the robotics housing in uh, affordable housing and the concrete housing in affordable housing and anything we can do to make it more affordable for our working people in this country uh, is, uh, I think, very important. Thank you. Thank all of you for uh, your fantastic and really interesting presentations. Um, Ed's given us permission to go a little bit longer in the Q&A so we can hear from all of you. Uh, but just to kind of kick it off, one of the questions I'd ask to, to everyone is, um, you know, Jason, at the beginning you, I, you indicated how investors love disruptors. And I think that's absolutely true in some areas. There's investors in other areas like housing finance that don't love new things. So what kind of challenges or what kind of work is being done to, um, I guess really for all of you, to help kind of bridge that gap and help housing finance and kind of the, the expectations and kind of not wanting to learn new things to really help um, accelerate some of these, uh, these ideas and kind of get them to market more quickly? <laughs> um, when we were doing our capital raise, one of the, the – there were plenty of concerns, but one of the <laughs> larger concerns was that the, that in, the construction industry by its nature is, is a state industry. It's not open to change. And would a disruptor you know, be welcomed? And to my complete surprise and, and – and, uh, um, <laughs> thankful uh, result is that we have no, tr the industry today is begging for change. The, the, anyone who is thinking in the, in the construction industry today recognizes that how we do it simply isn't right. 
An industry that wastes more than 30% of its material can't be sustainable. An industry that relies on an ever less sophisticated workforce can't work going forward. So solutions that address their problems, solutions that recognize that there is a better way to do it and are, are cogent in their um, expression are, are welcomed. I have had, I have, to the person, I have not had a customer tell me uh, or resist the idea of change. They may not like our price, you know, maybe they didn't like our schedule, but it had not to do with, no, I don't want to go there. They're coming to us. We have spent virtually nothing on marketing. You'll, you'll see us do more, but my point is that I, I personally believe that, that the construction industry is more than welcome to the idea of change today. That might suggest that the impediment is right at what we were talking about in the local communities, making land available uh, and uh, reducing the cost of construction. So that I agree with Jerry. I think every developer I've ever talked to has always been looking for new ways to, to build. The, the cost of labor has gone up. The availability is just not there. You can't find carpenters who are competent. Uh, so that... Uh, uh, I think we're ready for change, but are local communities ready for change? Yeah, I think that's I think that's one of those questions. What Ed, you've spent a tremendous amount of time working with uh, policymakers at the local level. What do, what barriers to change do you see happening, and what have you kind of how have you figured out ways to work past some of those changes or those challenges? So what, what we've done, and we looked at. Uh, robotics and uh, Rome uh, went through, uh, and you know, from a cost perspective, forget the distance because we were looking beyond their zone, uh, three, four, three hundred miles, four hundred miles. But um, there wasn't a cost savings per se. You got other savings. It was more energy efficient potentially. It was a better fit and finish and less waste and all that. But when you got to the final cost, there wasn't a huge much of a difference uh, from the traditional methodology. So we fo focused on, uh, and the printing alternative is something potentially worth looking at. We also looked at steel um, construction, which could also be fabricated off-site. Um, and so it's, a, it's really a, a fabrication off-site, and then you assemble it. Um, so we looked at that, and there was a local one in Sarasota that was doing, doing that. Um, and again, we couldn't find much in the way of cost savings. You had some other savings, but they didn't translate into, or other benefits they didn't translate into cost savings. So our approach was to look at a traditional um, uh, design, but use the best. We, we went with 80% concrete for a lot of different reasons, um, but the cost was minimally different, but you got a much better uh, product in, in the end, I agree, with everything uh, Jason said about you know concrete. Um, and you were much less subject to some of the labor issues because you didn't need carpenters uh, and uh, or very many carpenters, and, and the trusses were pre pre built and all of that. So we we got a cost that's actually down pretty far. What our real trouble was uh, was finding appropriately you know the land number one, um, even the price of land we pretty much could do. We we ended up locking up a. A 30-acre site that I think it ended up being seven or eight thousand dollars a unit, you know, for the 500 units we were looking at. So that that part is doable. We got it rezoned. Uh, it's really this this difference between what the market prices can be and all these extra costs that the localities have and the building codes and everything else have have put in. And and um, when uh, you know the, the talked about the building uh, code issues, a couple of examples were um, we had. Um, this national building code that I talked about a little bit yesterday, these three groups, they just sit around and come up with stuff. And it's, oh, it's the um, uh, sprinkler year. Well, let's talk about fire sprinklers. We haven't done much in fire sprinklers this for the last three years. Let's figure out how we're going to upgrade that. Well, somebody comes up with the idea of we're going to put in uh, a, a fan, exhaust fan, in the kitchen. And, you know, we're talking about efficiency units of 350 square feet. You know, the one bedrooms are 600 square feet. And at a cost, a construction cost of $80,000, uh, and it was $500. You know, when you add in all the stuff that you need to put in that little, the fan itself might be 100 but you have a lot of, you have to get electrical to the fan, you have to get exhaust, you got to get all this stuff, you got to get to an outside wall. 
and it ends up being $500. Well, that's a lot of money on a $75,000 construction cost. It's half that amount on a $150,000 construction cost. Uh, so that's one of the problems. The other was we ended up uh, putting, uh, we had buildings that were, um, I think, uh, 17 units per floor, three floors, 51 uh, units per building. We ended up, oh, we, we put two buildings together. They all had outside entrances and walkways. Uh, three stories. If we put three buildings together, we'd actually save one stairway because uh, you have to have you know stairway within so many feet of the units, both directions, and so the two buildings together would share a stairway. Well, that was like forty-five thousand dollars, and that was two hundred thousand dollars that we could save. Well, then all of a sudden we find out there's a building code requirement. We have all outside entrances. Every entrance is to the outside on a walkway, either first you know, on the first floor, second floor, third floor. No interior spaces, no interior hallways. Everything is out in the open. There's a requirement that you have fire doors on the outside that close when the fire alarm goes off. I'm going, why do you want to close the outside? There is the outside. Why would you want to put a door in? And, but that was the requirement. They never thought. The, and what triggered it? The amount under roof. They said, oh, when you have so much, when we went and put two buildings together, we had more under roof, therefore you now presumably needed these fire doors. And so they never think about these things. That was going to add, I can't remember, $150,000 or something for these fire doors. Uh, so those are the kinds of things we were running into. But we, we end up with a pretty narrow gap. It may turn out to be $100 a month in, in rent and that translates into a certain cost. It might be $15,000 a unit, whatever. Um, but if you can narrow, if you can get rid of that gap, you save what Ed described, which is billions and billions and billions of dollars that are spent on multifamily developments, and then the whole design of the program is to inflate the cost. Um, so that, that's the way we were you know, approaching it and continue to approach it. Any questions from the audience? Steve? Um, Steve Oliner, AEI. I have two questions. One quick question for Ed and one quick question for Jason. Jason, on your current technology, can you build two-story um, houses in order to economize on land? And, and Ed, do I hear what you're saying is that you're throwing in the towel on building economical rental housing without a federal program? <laughs> so to answer the first question, sure. we don't have a two-story printer yet, but it, it's the laws of physics by which one would build one or, or fairly straightforward. We have one on the drawing board. Um, I don't typically make product announcements at things like this, but stay tuned. So, <laughs> so uh, the answer is no, um, and I'm heading down uh, to uh, sort of re-figure uh, out you know, some approaches down in uh, southwest Florida. But the reason Tom and I were talking uh, – about the LIHTC program, we were actually asked um, to put together, you know, a response, and we worked with Ed also uh, on this. And we got sitting in uh, in our offices, and we basically, you know, we given everything we talked about yesterday, we need a way to jumpstart what we've lost over these thirty years. I mean, how do you get back on track? Um, in, in any time frame that makes sense. And so what Tom and I started noodling was, well, we need a supply-driven subsidy that will actually start jump-starting this, prove it can be done. That's why we think it needs to be sunset. Now, it's, it's dangerous in the federal government um, to, to start anything. And Tom mentioned, I mean, this was the latest example. If, if you've read the article about the tree program, I don't know if everybody, you know, if you've read it, but there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about during the Reagan administration, um, they decided that it would be great to uh, pay farmers in the South, mostly, to plant pine trees or whatever type of tree it was, it was. And they had this program. They paid so much per acre or tree or whatever it was. Ends up, I don't know, millions and millions and millions of trees get planted, and people are thinking this is, you know, going to be a, a long-term, uh, you know, growth <laughs> prospect, and they can retire with this. You know, they're going to have cr created this crop. And long story short, they end up way overplanting. Uh, number one, and number two, you know, 25, 30 years later, uh, they the price of lumber, not regarding what you've heard, is actually down. 
and so the trees aren't necessarily economical, and there's so many trees in this in these locations so close to each other that they've overwhelmed the sawmills and everything else, and so the price that the sawmills will pay for the raw trees is actually pretty minimal, and then they have to transport them, and so it's just created all, and the designer of the program, who would work for the soil conservation something or other, he was interviewed in the journal last week, and he says, my regret is, because this thing ended up backfiring, my regret is we should have put a sunset provision in this thing. It just should have been, you know, five years and then you're done, but we left it there and it just kept grow no pun intended, growing, growing, growing. But Ed, they're not very innovative because I can see the next subsidy program for those pine trees connected with global warming. We've got to keep those pine trees, <laughs> so let's pay them again. Yeah, pay them to keep them the car keep the far carbon locked up, so... Yeah, it's, it's a real challenge, but that was the struggle that Tom and I had, is how do we fill, get this gap in the middle that Lynn talked about yesterday? How do we get that jump started? And so we're just trying to throw out a bunch of ideas, and part of it is, and Barney Frank you know, said uh, you know, some things I agree with, one of which was you can't replace something with nothing. And, um, and he was talking about, I think, Fannie and Freddie at the time, um, but um, you also can't replace LIHTC with nothing. Um, and so the question is, what do you do that actually is going to help fix this? And I think uh, Dr. Carson has really taken this to heart. There's been a lot of a couple articles recently, but this affir affirmatively furthering fair housing is really trying to figure out how do we deal with some of these zoning issues. But again, you have to be careful. You, want to, you don't want to create the same problems that we created the last time we we just sort of dealt with this. You want to use a carrot, not a big club. This is for the gentleman from Icon. I think it's Jason. Oh. Um, hi, I have three questions for you. Uh, the first is in terms of the million homes requested, can you tell us anything about that outside the U.S., inside the U.S., developers, individuals, what are more states, you know, maybe um, the primary demand for that? I'm, I'm curious on that information. Um, the second, if I missed it, is the square, the current square footage capacity on the house. And then uh, the third is, do you have, are there any issues, because you're, you're getting the printer on site, correct? Are there any issues in terms of developing in, uh, or building in rural areas, maybe roads with, you know, <coughs> winding roads, thinner roads, gravel roads, or can you basically get the equipment anywhere? Thank you. Um, I'll take it top to bottom. The million homes are, the short answer is they're, they're global. And they're from, we did a, bit, did a big da data dive on the, on the leads that we have. And they are individuals. They are governments. They are developers. They are, and they're, and they're global. Uh, certainly concentrated in America, but the people who have stepped forward following up on, hey, when can I get these? The people who have stepped forward with sort of checks in their hand right away have been international, organi you know, from overseas. Um, the current square footage of the Vulcan 1, which is what we call our printers, about, can print up to about 1,000 square feet. Um, you could print longer because it would just look like a capital L, right? Sort of a width restriction. You can run it as far down the line as you want. It just gets to be a weird shape. Um, we are doing some experimentation with printing duplexes because of that ability. So you can print like a, a long line of 1,000 square foot sort of duplexes or triplexes or quadplexes. Um, rural areas, no problem. Um, matter of fact, all the areas we're going to right away are, are rural. We designed the first generation of the printer for uh, the developing world because that's where the paying customers were to begin with. And so we made it out of all aluminum. It's, it uses low-power motors, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been, it's been very ruggedized and, and can be transported almost anywhere on a, on a standard shipping container or open bed trailer. Yeah. Hi, my name is Rachel Siegel. I'm at the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, my first question is about uh, the LIFT program. I'm curious what kind of political will you see uh, for that program and what kind of hurdles you think you might have to overcome to, to gain traction there. And then the other question is in terms of, a um, separate one, in terms of uh, manu new manufacturing technologies, um, are the, what are the serious hurdles in being able to have it more widespread adoption in the U.S.? So on uh, Lift Home, um, it comes down to sort of having the, the political stars in alignment. Uh, we think there's some potential for that after the election. Um, we think that there's um, sort of some additional recognition and, and 
everything we talked about yesterday uh, goes to this. Our, our policy that we've had for 50 or 60 years, and Tom described it, is uh, we take low-income, lower-income people um, who um, have more challenges from health and, and family and, and economic and everything else, and we put them in the riskiest loans, um, and uh, we drive up the prices of the homes, uh, as, as uh, Tobias described yesterday, which creates immense volatility, and then the foreclosures come in later, and then we wonder why it failed. And so we, we, said we have to break that paradigm and try something else. So we've been spending a lot of time describing what the current problems are. Um, we've got the, the wealth building home loan. With, the lift home is a, a, a resulted from our wealth building home loan concept, which is in practice in what, 30, 40 lenders around the country. Yeah, and uh, it's been for a few years. We continue to uh, socialize that. Uh, uh, Steve and I are heading down to St. Pete uh, in a couple weeks to talk to the credit union um, market uh, uh, function down there, their convention. Um, so we think that that probably has more chance uh, after the election. The it's, it's harder on the economical housing development tax credit side only because the interests in LIHTC are so entrenched um, and there's so much rent-seeking that goes on there among both the uh, advocates and the, uh, the businesses. Um, that that's going to take uh, a, a more, you know, better alignment over time. But we think there's an opportunity for lift home. Bill, let me just say, maybe the pendulum has swung so far that some people are recognizing it. And I, I, by the way, I work with a methadone clinic in Baltimore, probably the largest in the country. And we're facing the knot in my backyard on trying to establish halfway houses for uh, substance abuse patients. And... When we went into the zoning uh, department, we actually got a very welcome uh, response from at least some of the people, not all. <laughs> the board rejected some housing we wanted. But the professionals were actually seeing a need to change some of the zoning and wanted us to work with them and with their planning department to try to see if we can't come up with some concepts that threaten the neighborhoods less. The mayor said she only wants these in Timbuktu, uh, and, uh, uh, and, yet, and yet allow us to build somewhere. So maybe, maybe some of this is, is, some of the communities may be receptive. Um, you said one of the, I think I understood your second question to be like, what are the obstacles to some of this innovation? And I, I would actually say that the whole premise of a subsidy is, is a big part of the deal. Um, my technology can deliver a better house faster and cheaper, but I'm going to have to go out to market and compete against subsidized inferior ways of building. In fact, if the subsidies had never been there in the first place, there's a world in which this innovation would have happened faster. Um, but, it, but as long as you make poor ways of doing things appear cheaper, um, then, then you, you're, not, you're not going to have the, the market, sort of the economic forcing function to find a better way. And so... That, that, that's the big blockers, that, is that it, it, it makes it muddy to the consumer, to developers, to investors, which, which really is the best, fastest, cheapest way to build a house. But if you sort of cleared the field and said, everybody go at it, it would be very clear very quickly. Investors are smart, savvy people. Governments are smart, generally smart, savvy people. Um, in, in, in a way, would emerge quite quickly, I think. And, and, the, and the, the capital would follow and, and the work would follow. So. Let me add to that, using the automobile example, imagine what would have happened if the government had a, you know, five thousand dollars subsidy on buying a car, um, and <laughs> y you would not have cars selling as cheaply as they do today, and everybody being more or less able to afford a. What I say is, they can any virtually anybody in the United States can afford a serviceable new or used car. How do we know that? There are whatever the number is, two hundred million cars or whatever, and there are two hundred and ten million households or whatever. Virtually every not households, people above the age of eighteen. Therefore, virtually everybody who wants a car gets a car. And if you look around, compared to thirty years ago, virtually every car, almost every car you see is serviceable. That wasn't the case thirty years ago. Um, they had clunkers, a lot of clunkers, um, just because they didn't last very long and they rusted. But today. You don't see a lot. You don't see clunkers because they're really corrosion resistant. 
Um, and so, and they last a long time. They, you know, they, they, they just are much more serviceable than they were. So you can buy a car 10 years old for three or $4,000 and still get five years of good service out of it. That's, that's really why that works, and it's because there was never a subsidy for cars. It struck me that on these homes that you're producing, the smaller homes, that it'd be a perfect fit for all the empty land in my hometown of Detroit and where I'm working now in Baltimore, we have this empty land. We have a lot of people who don't need a lot of square footage because while we talked about workers within this framework, there's also, for example, a lot of substance abuse people who have really destroyed their lives, frankly, but they're now 40, 50 uh, up. Uh, they're working as dishwashers and as uh, laborers, different places. And if you could combine this concept of the empty land with your, your housing, uh, modest scale works for, for these folks. And it just struck me that I'd like to continue some discussions. <laughs> well, thank you all for your presentations. And uh, I think we've got about a 20 minute break here. So I want to begin by introducing our panelists for the panel uh, moderating, or excuse me, modernizing the appraisal process. So on my far left, I have Ritesh Bansal. He's the CEO of is it Versus? Appraisal.ai. Appraisal.ai. Adam Johnston, the chief appraiser for Genworth, and Scott Reuter, the chief appraiser for Freddie Mac, and for you data analysts in the audience, I'll make this simple. We have two chiefs and one Indian. I got permission to do that. <laughs> I, I figured you. I, I figured you had me on a ten-second delay anyway, uh, Ed. So That's you Cherokee could, for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ed's right there, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right He's got an eye on me. Uh, Almost two years ago, uh, November 16, 2016, I was asked to testify before the House Subcommittee on Housing and Insurance, and the topic was modernizing appraisals, a regulatory review, and the future of the industry. And uh, I promised no slides myself, and uh, particularly no charts and graphs, but uh, in your handout, I, I do. I did draw this little picture one night, uh, and I did this, uh, presented this uh, before Congress, and uh, this is all they remember, frankly. So, uh, what's the pictures? And um, because it perfectly illustrates the spaghetti map that uh, comprises the appraisal regulatory schema. So, you know, as as my panelists delve into this topic, just keep in mind that there's all sorts of exciting, cool technologies that could be applied to our profession, uh, but we have some regulatory handcuffs that uh, uh, restrain a lot of that innovation. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ritesh. I'm really excited to talk about this today because I began my career at long-term capital. And <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> and I don't think anybody should be part of trying to crash the global, global economy twice in their careers. So I will try to do some, some uh, atonement here. So uh, we build uh, AI driven learning models. Sorry. Yeah. So, so we build uh, AI-driven machine learning models uh, for valuation. And I wanted to speak more broadly about the potential of the models, but also the risks in the landscape and how the evolution is going and what can potentially go wrong in, uh, with, with valuation models. So this is the picture of what we see as the original landscape for housing today. So roughly about six to 
8 million loans are originated, this is both GSE, private label, it might be a slightly higher number, maybe 9 to 10 in a boom year, but roughly about 6 to 8 million. And that is the biggest slice today where they use uh, valuation models. On the left of that, you will see a section called um, uh, annual home sales. So roughly about 4 to 5 million home sales a year. And an increasing share of that is by uh, iBuyers like, like Open Door or Knock. Uh, they make instant offers, uh, near instant offers to, to, home, to home sellers. And also portfolio buyers like Colony Capital who are buying up you know, homes without actually doing an appraisal. They're buying them just based on a valuation model. So there are about four trends that we think will really drive model usage. The, the first one is uh, there are appraisal waivers increasingly from lenders and GSE. Uh, they want faster appraisals. They want cheaper appraisals. They want better, maybe. Uh, there are institutional buyers. Uh, there are, there are uh, uh, iBuyers we talked about. And finally, there's a bigger trend towards desktop appraisals where an appraiser is sitting at a desk, he's looking at an inspection report, and he has multiple inputs, he or she, from AVMs, and they're doing an a appraisal at the desktop. So in, 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 in a sense, they are reconciling the different AVM inputs to create their opinion of value. So all this is driving AVM usage. And just a little, little background on how, from the financial modeling perspective, we look at AVMs. So valuation, as we all know, has three approaches. One is the sales approach, look at recent sales. Um, the second approach is look at replacement value or cost, the cost approach. And finally, look at the income approach, which is a multiplier of what this asset can generate. Uh, and that's the value. So AVM models are definitely sales models. They are not cost-based models, and they are not income models. Going back a little bit up to looking at actual financial modeling, um, almost every price model can be characterized in two buckets. It's either a momentum model or it's a mean rewarding model. So momentum model would be, a, for example, a trend-following model. The stock is going up. Let's buy it. You're doing a momentum strategy. Uh, this stock is overvalued because the industry P ratio is 15, and this stock is trading at 25. It's overvalued. That's a mean rewarding model. So almost all AVMs today, as they exist, are momentum models. So they will follow the market on the way up. They'll follow the market on the way down. But they're not giving you any kind of historical basis as to is this property overvalued vis-a-vis -vis the equilibrium in this area. So a great, great example is in the sand cities, uh, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Dallas, in, a boom, in boom time, the market value far exceeds the replacement value. And it, it spread develops. And then over time, when the boom comes back down, that spread shrinks. So today, it's very hard to teach an AVM model about that. There is a class of hybrid AVMs that we have built that we're still testing, which has a mean reverting aspect to it. Uh, but they're not, in, they're not used in practice. Finally, there will be increasing usage of AVMs in a, in a, in a, in a, in a capital <coughs> adequacy framework. So we will not use AVMs per se to say, is this a good loan? Is this a good transaction? But rather, is this a good loan? Is there enough equity in this property to, in, to recover the, the unpaid balance? So that is using AVMs in a capital adequacy framework, even maybe using an expected loss uh, calculation. So uh, customer warning, I have to say this. All models are wrong. Some are useful. Um, there's a very famous quote by Warren Buffett, uh, which is oft quoted, but they leave out the, the preamble. Uh, he said that derivatives are, are instruments of mass destruction what he said before that was derivative pricing models give absurd results, and that's why derivatives are weapons of mass destruction. So it is really this model-driven uh, pricing which, when used blindly, 
can lead to some very destructive outcomes. So just a simple, a, a short segue, sort of how I view the hierarchy of models out there. So we have some really excellent models today in the world. Uh, almost any physical model that is out there is a phenomenal model. Things that we use to model how planes fly, bridges, dams, nuclear reactors, even weather to a great extent, these models work really, really well. We rarely hear about, you know, this dam failed because the engineers screwed up the model, uh, or, or this plane crashed because they had the wrong model. So these are really great models. They work very well. And then we have what I call a, the decent models. Uh, actual models actually are pretty decent. You rarely hear about insurance companies failing because they they underestimated the risk of underwriting, underwriting some insurance. Uh, disease models are pretty good. Uh, even, I would say, I would go on a limb and say personal credit scoring, uh, FICO scores, even though it's a very limited, simple model, it does work really well. Again, you rarely hear about uh, 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 banks extending too much credit based on, 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 on scoring individual credit. And then we have a whole category of uh, what I would call terrible models. <laughs> and there's a lot of economists in the room, so you know, I have insurance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so almost any uh, financial economic model does pretty well on this hierarchy of models. Macro models, derivatives pricing, credit ratings, uh, population models, demand forecasting. So one thing you will see in this hierarchy is we're going from the physical to the human. As human interaction increases, the models get worse and worse and worse because there are feedback loops, humans try to game the models, and that makes models less, you know, less effective. Okay. So I want to segue, segue a bit and talk about AVM accuracy. Uh, today, how do we look at AVM accuracy? And then try to bring home today how we look at AVMs and what is really broken about that paradigm. So there are many ways to look at the accuracy of an AVM. The, the top two measures are what's called the MDAP, or the Median Absolute Percentage Error. And the second measure is what's called PP10, which is how many, how many properties fall within 10% of, of the sales price. So let's say I build an AVM and I want to benchmark it. How would I go about benchmarking it? So on November 1st, I would give you, let's say the AVM is for Montgomery County. So on November 1st, I would give you my prediction of every single property in Montgomery County. So there are roughly about, I think, 200,000 properties, maybe a bit less, in, in the county. So I would give you my prediction on November 1st. You would uh, stash that in a wall somewhere. And then over the next 30 days, roughly, there would be something between 500 to 1,000 sales that would happen in that county. And on November 30th, you would pull out my predictions for those 500 sales and look at the error of those 500 sales. And then you would say, what is the median of my error? And that would be the MDAP. And how many properties fall within 10% of error? And that would be the PP10. So those two are some of the primary ways we look at AVM efficacy. So now we know that, so let's take an example. So on the left, we have Cook County, Illinois, and on the right, we have Maricopa, which is Phoenix. And you can see that the PPE 10 for Cook County is 42%, which means that for this AVM model, 42% of the sales that were recorded had error less than 10%. It's a pretty terrible model. On the, on the right, we have Maricopa County, and for that month, that, uh, that model, the sales that happened, about almost 70% of sales had error less than 10%. It's a pretty, pretty good model. Let's look at the same, the same model. Let's look at the MDAP. In that case, it turns out that for Cook County, the median error of all the sales that happened was about 12%, and for, for Maricopa, it was about Six and a half percent, and that is, you know, that's that's very good for Maricopa. For Cook County, it is not terrible, but it's not terribly good either. Okay, 
So now that we know how to look at how to look at uh, AVM errors, let's look at what Dot Frank says about AVMs. So what I want to really bring home is there's a lot of regulation around appraisals. There's a lot of understanding of the appraisal process, the, the deficiencies in it, and how to address them. And this has been built up for the last 50 years. There are state-by-state -state regulations, and there's a lot of, lot of know-how in the industry. So Dodd-Frank actually laid down this rule saying that there should be uh, standards for QC, there should, be, there should be random sample testing, and there should be some standards around uh, manipulation of data. So this rule came out in 2014, and today this is all the AVM standards, which means there are none. So there are actually no standards around AVM construction, what data can be used, what testing can be done. So there's a, there's a kind of regulatory arbitrage that's also happening between appraisals and AVMs. There's a huge body of standards, US PAP, certifications for appraisers, you know, Dot Frank, AMC, so on and so forth. There's almost nothing around AVMs. So now that we know that and we know how to evaluate AVMs, let's do a thought experiment. Let's ask ourselves, how good of an AVM can we build in the next five minutes? Not even 10, five minutes. So this is some data that I pulled for uh, Clark County, Nevada, which is Las Vegas, and for Phoenix, which is Maricopa County in the bottom. So we have about a panel of roughly, I think, 200 sales that I pulled. So what you see there is, there is the assessment value, which is the second column from the left, and then you have the sales value on the right. So let's take this panel data set and build a very simple AVM from it. So my first AVM, I'm going to say, let's make it really simple. I'm just going to use the assessment value as my prediction. So I'm going to take this column, second column, and if you ask me for a forecast for any of these addresses, I'm just going to give you the assessment value. Right? So let's run with that. We use that as a simple AVM, and we look at the error. So no property, well, less than, it's less than 1% actually. So less than 1% of property, properties have an error less than 10%. So it's a really terrible model. So the PPE 10 is zero basically. It's rounded down. It's like half percent. And the median error, powered up, but the median error is 400%. So it's a very, 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 very bad model. So we look at that and say, you know what? We can do a little bit better. Let's go back to the data and say, can we multiply the assessment value by something to make it better? So if you just eyeball this data, you, you say, well, for Nevada, it looks like if I give it a multiplier of four, the assessment is closer to the sales price. And if I give a multiplier of two for Arizona, it's a better model. So. For our next model, which we call the smart AVM, if you ask us for the assessment value, I will just multiply by four for every property in Las Vegas and by two for every property in, in Arizona. So once I do that, run my accuracy metrics, this is what I get. I'm sorry, the median error is covered up again. So the PPE 10 is now 32%, which means 32% of those sales have error less than 10%. And the median error, I think, is now on the, on the order of about 50 or 60%, which is a vast improvement from zero for the PP10 and 400% for the median error in the last model. So, you know, so far so good. And then we have an enterprising ABM builder, Lance A, who says, hey, why don't we use the MLS values? They're out there. It's publicly available. So the algorithm now is, if you ask me for a prediction and the property is on the MLS, I'll give you that price. And if the property is not on the ABM, I'll give you what I did last time. 
is multiply the assessment value by two or four. Once we do that, the PPE 10 jumps to 81%, which is actually a commercially viable AVM. And the median error drops to 2%. So this is what it looks like in the end. So the simple AVM typo there is, is terrible, 0% PPE 10. The smart AVM is 23%. And the cheat AVM is 81%. So the, the, the other fact that is very salient is today most commercial AVMs use MLS data. And if you're a lender who's underwriting loans using that model, what you are, what you are, you are not getting an independent objective assessment of value. Sorry, Joan Price. Uh, what you are getting is the realtor's opinion of what that house would sell for in that market because they basically use the MLS value for a purchase transaction, right? So if you're underwriting a loan for a purchase transaction, all you're getting is something very, very close to what the realtor put on the MLS. So you're not actually, the, the AVM in that case is not actually adding any information to that, to the valuation process. And this is a really big problem today with AVMs, is they look really excellent on paper. There's some vendors that go out there and say, our AVMs are 95% accurate, which is actually, if that was a real model, they would be a genius. They could actually trade on it. But they're not trading on it, they're just, they're just, they're just selling it. And, and that, you know, that itself has uh, uh, information in there. So, so one, one big takeaway from this is we need some independent standards around, around AVMs, around benchmarking, around quality standards. And, and without that, um, any new innovation that comes out in the AVM space uh, will will get swamped. Um, I'll skip through these slides and just go to the last one. There's a lot of innovation with machine learning and AI that we can bring, but without having independent standards, we just uh, uh, we cannot distinguish between a good model and a terrible model. So I'll stop with that. Thank you. Uh, Adam, you're up next. Fantastic. Um, well, uh, first off, I'm, uh, I'm moving on the fly, so I'm, I've learned that some of the slides in my presentation probably won't be real relevant to you. So I'm going to blow right by them. So it isn't that I missed them. I'm deliberately avoiding them. Um, so uh, just a little, little background on me so you know my, my worldview, where I'm coming from from a, a real estate standpoint. So I'm an appraiser by trade, 25 years. Um, uh, uh, doing appraisals in a variety of different capacities. I was a police officer for 10 years as well, served in the Marine Corps as a machine gunner, which is a natural segue into appraisal. Um, so a few different experiences, project management, et cetera. But uh, I've learned a few things, and, and I try to apply them to the real estate appraisal. I did have a front row seat uh, for the collapse. Um, it was morbid to watch. Um, I, I watched the lead up, working with a lot of the subprime lenders, um, and in, enduring some of the, the, the punishment of appraisers coming in uh, below what was expected, um, and uh, and then I and then uh, working for a mortgage insurance company, uh, I saw the other side. So, uh, what is the consequence uh, to those type of behaviors? So, um, I really appreciated some of the stuff Tom said. So, I wrote down a quote which I thought um, ponder on a little bit um, because I appreciate the the manner in which you you approach housing and uh, the need for people to have it and to have a long-range view. And there was a quote from Nelson Henderson, which I found fascinating. It says that the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. So um, let me first uh, start off um, by uh, letting you know I work for Genworth, and anything I say is just my personal opinions uh, and not Genworth's. So, um, 
I'll share with you my views on when we talk about modernizing the appraisal profession, where do we, where do we think things are going, I'll, um, and uh, kind of wrap in uh, a lot of the things that have already been shared, um, which make a lot of sense. Um, Genworth is an uh, international mortgage insurance company. You also do life insurance and long-term care. Uh, so risk management is at the heart of how we continue to exist. Um, so uh, there are people in this world, such as mortgage insurance companies, who live and are a viable enterprise because we take other people's risks and in turn get paid for it, right? So it, for us, it's about being smart, about understanding the risks that we're taking and pricing for those risks so that we can be an ongoing business concern. Um, so there's nothing wrong with employing technologies uh, that may create efficiencies, uh, may create cost savings for people um, uh, seeking to buy a home. Uh, it's an expensive prospect to buy a home, so if we can reduce those costs, uh, that's useful. Uh, so these technologies can help do that. The important thing and the theme that I'd like to convey in this is that, look, you got to understand the risks, which means you got to have your eyes wide open. you got to have sufficient data. Quality, the quantity, and the breadth of the data needs to be there in order to make an informed decision about the risks that you're taking. So I think if we reflected back in the crisis, which was a fabulous learning experience, despite how devastating it was, we saw who paid and who didn't, right, under what circumstances. So can we be smarter going forward in taking on risks and pricing for them? So with that said, um, a couple things that we'll pop through today. Uh, give a few consideration points. I'll go quickly through that. Uh, we'll talk about real estate valuation in the market today. So what's the current state of affairs on valuation? And, and it, this is specific to real estate, not other forms of like BV and personal property. Uh, we'll talk about appraisers versus non-appraisers uh, in the valuation space. And then to kind of finish off with managing market modulation. So when, what I mean by that is... Um, we're in a market where uh, uh, things go up and they go down. Um, and you've got to be able to survive and, and make money, and people still have to be able to buy houses when markets are going down. Uh, we still have to provide capital to people who need a place to live. And so how do you manage through those modulations without putting yourself out of business? Uh, Bob Lutz, designer for uh, multiple companies, uh, uh, car companies, had a, had a very good quote in uh, the book Why GM Matters. And he, on his philosophy and risk management, was that we spend so much time trying to avoid the big risks that are large and they're obvious and they're wide. But we should be equally, if not more, concerned with the small risks that although low in probability are very deep, meaning that if you fall in them, they take out the enterprise. So, um, you know, I, I think that that's a good uh, consideration to take when we talk about valuation and how do you fit these things in here without... Uh, blindly walking or in a trance-like state into risks that, that culminate in a crisis like we recently lived through. So um, um, let's move on. Um, so considerations. A collateral valuation matters. I don't say that just because I'm, I'm an appraiser. Uh, it matters. Skin in the game matters. We've heard that multiple times already today. Uh, we certainly see much higher loss rates on properties with much lower skin in the game. Um, so it matters. Uh, so we want to understand the V in loan-to-value ratio. We want to understand it with a re reasonably strong confidence. Um, uh, from a uh, uh, um, let me let me get let me get right through. So, but data will be key. So we again I mentioned earlier we want to complete data. Uh, we want uh, we want accuracy and reliability. And we want enough quantity. Uh, those those are key ingredients to make decisions. So when you see up on the screen, this is just an illustration that real estate uh, is unique. It doesn't mean that it can't be valued, that it's a, an exclusion of AVMs because real estate differs. That's absolutely not the case. But real estate's different. So I thought you might enjoy this. This is an actual house that uh, uh, came in um, for mortgage insurance, and it ha happened to have a multi-cell jail in it as well. So um, for the, this is probably a fascinating house at Halloween time. Uh, here's another example for you to feast on. Um, this happened to be three grain silos um, that had been converted into a two-family or a two-unit dwelling. Um, probably not easy to value that. Um, the, the square footage might match up to other houses in the area, but probably a very different buyer for this type of home. And this is one. Of, this is one. I, I used to drive by this property, uh, and, and one day I stopped and took the picture at the risk of being shot. And uh, 
Um, I looked at it, and the first thing that occurred to me is that real estate or personal property. Anybody want to take a gather? There you go. The tree, I, I think we would, that's fast, outstanding, outstanding answer, right? So the tree is certainly real estate, and, uh, you know, that happened to have grown right through the hedge. So, uh, but I did think about, uh, this was in Ohio, I did think about the fact that if a tornado were to strike, that house would just spin right around on that tree, you know, furniture going out the window, right? So, um, so let's get to something serious here. Uh, I, while being an appraiser, I am not an apologist for the appraisal profession, meaning that uh, I recognize fully, and it was mentioned earlier, there are strengths and there are vulnerabilities, there are weaknesses in every process, okay? And, and the key is recognizing them and not misapplying or, or blindly following. So this is an example of a real-life a real, life real estate appraisal. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to show you the down and dirty because this stuff happens. So this is a portion of the Uniform Residential Appraisal Report. And uh, I'd like to point out in the upper section there, in the site section, you see that the appraiser identifies the view in the upper right corner as a neutral view. That's what the N is. And it's residential. So the appraiser's told us it's a neutral view. It's not adverse. It's not positive. It's just neutral. And then a little farther down, you'll see that there's a question on the form. It says, are there any adverse site conditions or external factors? Adverse site conditions or external factors. The appraiser affirmatively answers no and then actually states that there's no external factors. We get down into the sales comparison grid, which is a, the snapshot at the bottom, and you'll see that the appraiser says that the subject property has a neutral residential view consistent with page one and, and compares it to sales that he says has a neutral residential view. So let's look at the reality courtesy of Microsoft Bing. There's a little orange pin on the map to the upper left corner, and that is the subject property that was being appraised. As you might notice to the south of it there, uh, that is certainly not a residential property. That might be considered by most people to be adverse, but that's not all. So let's look at the rear yard of the subject <laughs> property. It's it worse. That, my friends, is a jail. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So, now, I'm not sure how that might have escaped the appraiser's view, um, but, but this was in Minnesota, and, uh, and I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we were able to find this out in a matter of moments, and yet the appraiser, the boots on the ground that visited that house, said that was a neutral view with no adverse site conditions. Wouldn't have been adverse. Close to work. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so that just illustrates the point, okay, and that fairness. So uh, um, appraisers aren't perfect. So I'm not going to stand here and say the appraisers are a solution to all the problems, that we need to stick the way we're doing it just because it was a human being that walked outside, okay? So real estate valuation today, we have automated valuations in the market. Uh, great example, uh, so examples given. I am a fan of the proper use of automated valuations, not only as a quality control tool or a quality assurance tool or a bulk valuation tool where you've got to value 600,000 properties in a portfolio, which is not practical to do an appraisal on all of those, um, but, but there's a place in, in, in my mind for automated valuations as a prime valuation tool. Um, again, it's understanding the right circumstances in which to place it. The other piece I'll put here is we talked about risk management. It, we do it in auditing all the time. We accept the fact that for most, unless you're building medical equipment, you don't want any defects in medical equipment, right? Because there's pretty big consequences when it goes wrong. But if we're talking about real estate valuation, we're going to accept the fact that there's going to be defect rates. And we're going to accept a certain amount of defect. And then we're going to audit to make sure that the stuff that we missed or didn't get right, that it stays within a tolerance, within an appetite that we have. So we're going to set that. So we'll talk about in, in some of these examples of what's a proper application? What are some examples of when we could use an automated valuation, save everybody a bunch of money and a bunch of time, and still come up with a highly confident result, um, but use it the right way? There are also, of course, appraiser valuations where we, we send a, a, a fully credentialed, licensed, certified appraiser out to a property to do a job for which they've been highly trained to do. Uh, we have non-appraiser valuations. Uh, so think about broker price opinions. That's a common 
a colloquial term applied to maybe a real estate agent doing the valuation. Again, there's a place for, for that as well. Uh, real estate va- uh, agents are immersed in their markets. They're walking with buyers and sellers each and every day. They're listening to the comments. They're highly tuned in to the properties in their market. It's unfair for an appraiser to say, simply because you don't have an appraisal license, you suddenly don't have a qualified opinion about property value. So there's a way to incorporate them. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then uh, hybrid valuations, where, uh, as as, uh, it was mentioned earlier, we have uh, appraisers being uh, uh, synthesized with uh, data and results from other uh, data collection. Um, So we're kind of leveraging expertise from multiple multiple places to get efficiencies and still get a a, a reliable value opinion. Um, A a real estate evaluation is like everything else. It's being affected not only by technologies, but by the immense amount of data that we're gathering. We're taking the data and we're turning it into information and the information we can make usable decisions on. So there's no stopping this. Um, So we're going to acknowledge the fact that that the real estate valuation industry is going to move along in the continuum of more and more automation being inserted into the process, and that's okay. We just have to be smart about how we use it, right? Um, So appraisers and non-appraisers. So uh, let's uh, roll through this. Real estate appraisers have credentials. They're state licensed. They have exams. They have educational requirements. They have continued education requirements. Uh, There's professional uh, organizations out there that have additional standards on the top and qualifications. They have appraisers of ethical obligations. They are forbidden from being advocates for any party. That makes appraisers very unique in this process because they're one of the only individuals in the process that actually is required to be unbiased, objective, and uh, when we say bias, we're not talking about they don't have their own biases, but they wouldn't be biased toward any particular party. That's the requirement. If they're found violating those requirements, the appraiser's livelihood can be plucked out from underneath them. That's a pretty severe consequence. They can be disciplined by state appraisal boards. Anyone can complain on them. And so that, that makes them a little unique. And appraisers are the only one in this transaction that actually has to defend their opinions. They actually have to show the work product based on recognized methods and techniques, and they have to be able to defend it. And they can be judged years later for whether they were right or wrong. It's a pretty, pretty significant thing. So now let's, let's contrast that against some of these other products that we talked about. So uh, mentioned earlier, uh, so when we look at other products, we say, are there standards? Or is it the Wild West? Can I only judge the outcome but not be certain how the outcome will behave over a time continuum? So you might be accurate today, we'd be accurate tomorrow. Um, Methods. uh, So they use recognized methods and techniques. Is there any credentialing? Um, uh, So uh, uh, for those that paid attention to the crisis, we had uh, some very, very smart people that wrote some very, very sophisticated models that were very, very wrong. Um, Put put 100-year-old businesses out of business. Um, and then is there accountability? I asked an AVM developer one time, he said, oh, he's talking about the, the merits of automated valuations. I said, when was the last time you sued for being wrong? When was the last time a homeowner called you up and threatened you over the hill for being wrong? Um, there's a little difference there, a little disparity. There's no neck to choke. I hate to use some you know, bad examples. But, um, so when we talk about modernizing real estate appraisal, I'm going to give you one quick example. Um, uh, I'm not going to mention the name of the company, but there was a city in Ohio, uh, fairly remote. Um, There was really no employment around it. It was its own employment hub. And uh, a large uh, package carrier service came in uh, to the local airport and made significant investments to build out to be a regional package distribution center. Their jets were coming in and out. Um, that caused a lot of uh, good jobs, uh, high-paying jobs, to come into the community. Um, houses were being built, subdivisions developed, new businesses were coming in. It was thriving, and that went on for years. The data that existed in that market demonstrated a thriving market. One day I woke up and read the newspaper, and that carrier service announced that they were closing that facility. What do you think happened to real estate values in that town at that exact moment? When the people in that town became aware that they were now no longer going to have a job 
and they were going to have to actually leave to go find one. What do you think happened to real estate values? Yeah, that's bad news for the town, right? So as an appraiser, I was thrilled. Sounds kind of sick, doesn't it, right? Not thrilled because I didn't empathize with the people that are now put in this circumstance. I was thrilled because of the data that we were about to get, right? And the data was is that I knew that something significant had just occurred in that market. And all the people in that town who had their houses on the market at that time also knew. So guess what happened to list prices immediately thereafter? People begin to lower the list price. And they not only once, twice, three times, really fast in sequence because they knew they needed to get out while they could. Okay? So, but yet, all of the data that our valuation models would have relied upon is not reflective of the market today, right? Now, do you think this is the only time that that's happened in the United States? No. So do you think that we could study other markets where, they, where these types of situations has happened and watch what happened in the aftermath, and then we could apply that to today and say, hey, look, there's no data currently in this town today, but this is what's happened to other towns when these type of announcements have happened. We could actually consider variables that formerly didn't have meaning in the model and adapt to them and apply it right away, right? So a little difference there. Um, so again, we're talking about probabilities. Um, uh, it, so what's the probability of occurrence? What's the severity? So managing during uh, mo uh, market modulations. Um, so this will kind of finish off uh, the notion that um, uh, we have to manage in markets that are going up and down. We have to provide money to people to acquire housing and to finance housing in markets, whether they're good or bad can't isolate people. Um, and so uh, when we talk about uh, modulating markets, I'm, I think of a playbook, right? So we utilize an automated valuation model in circumstances in which we can get a high confident valuation outcome. But we also know that we adjust the tolerances when markets begin to turn so that we begin to say, all right, do we, are we going to shrink the automated valuation use and move over to, uh, uh, you know, an appraiser or a hybrid type model? So that's more of a playbook, being very thoughtful and deliberate about how we look at collateral risk and then how we apply the tolerances and uh, when we revisit them. We also should be auditing these models. As I mentioned earlier, there are third-party testing companies that go through and test these models continually. And uh, I, I'm running out of time or nearly ran out of time, so I'll finish off with this. Uh, um, you know, we test models. We use third-party testing companies to test them. And I've seen models that were formerly what I would consider accurate within the context of an automated valuation model fall off the cliff because the automated valuation company became distracted with other pursuits and stopped maintaining the models. And what ended up happening is the accuracy eroded substantially within the course of a year. Um, so uh, that goes to the systemic behavior where when you rely upon automation, you have to be careful because when it starts to go wrong, it can go wrong and it can go wrong in tens of thousands of properties. Last thing I want to say is we've seen a move to try to save money in transactions and in, in, in the cost of, of loan origination. We tend to see models behave, um, they don't behave as well in markets where, uh, so I'm going to say uh, markets that are distressed. Well, that can create a disparate impact where the wealthy folks living in the homogenous suburbs get the advantage of paying less for the loan because they don't have to pay for an appraisal, while the person in the inner city in the more difficult market has to cough up four or $500 for an appraisal. So uh, I think those are other things that we want to be mindful of is, is, is who's being affected by the savings, who's enjoying the savings and who's not. So, off there. Scott Reuter. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Ed and Lynn and Steve and all our friends here at uh, AI for the kind invitation to join you here today and my friend Joan Trice. Um, following uh, lauding thanks, it is recognized I am the last speaker on the last session of the last day. So hopefully I can compliment my friends uh, Ritesh and uh, Adam 
and uh, give a little bit of an appraiser's perspective on uh, modernization. So what's a GSE presentation without a disclaimer? The, uh, my comments here today are my own. And for any accuracy or clarification, anything regarding Freddie Mac, you're kindly encouraged to reference our uh, published seller service or guide. So I have some prepared materials here today to, uh, to kind of run through, mostly as a backdrop to a broader discussion around modernization of appraisal. Uh, to me, a discussion about modernization of the appraisal process begins with a look at the current process. So we'll do that in the a few bullets around LCA, our loan collateral, collateral advisor tool, uh, the appraiser capacity uh, nationwide in uh, modernization, innovation around waivers. Then we'll get to modernization, and I'll kind of speak to a concept around just kind of a, a spectrum or valuation, uh, 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 c continuum rather, around va valuation need. So the bigger the asset class, the more eyes on the technology. So recognizing how important housing is, like our friends uh, at, at Fannie Mae, we've developed tools around ways that we can begin to analyze and look at and score the uh, quality as it relates to risk of uh, the appraisals that we consume. So we're constantly working at Freddie Mac to continue to develop and improve and iterate on our tool. And basically the, the engine scores property eligibility, valuation completeness, accuracy, and again, quality as it relates to risk. Uh, LCA for us really is our lens, our lens into appraisal behavior and appraiser quality, bless you. Uh, reports are analyzed for, again, completeness, quality, and valuation risk. Messaging is sent to our lender clients. It's not sent directly to the appraiser. It's sent to our lender clients who then interact with the messaging relative to whatever flag may have been triggered relative to comp selection, excessive uh, or accuracy of the information reported, maybe excessive adjustments as compared to other properties, again, just to draw attention to where there may be risk as it relates to that developed report. So one of the important components really about modernization and around do we need to modernize is really the relative capacity of appraisers nationwide. And this little exercise and a few of the slides that follow were born out of a, um, an analytic exercise that we did around trying to determine back in 2016 whether or not there was an appraiser shortage. So in 2016, we were in the middle of a giant refinance crunch, and we kept hearing there's an appraiser shortage, there's an appraiser shortage everywhere, it's nationwide, it's, you know, it's kind of, it was, was out of control. So the one thing we did was we, we put a couple of the analysts on our team loose. So we either have to myth bust this, support it, defend it. So basically we took, a, at the time, a five-year look back and now a six-year look back at the appraisals submitted to the UCDP portal. Uh, we made a couple of assumptions. We see a lot of uh, one-off names, but uh, to be counted in our appraiser count, you had to have done one appraisal a month or five a year. You were in our count. So this is accurate only to that degree. These slides animate, and again, they're, they're essentially a six-year look back at submissions to the UCDP portal. Uh, this will not include any government, VA, FHA, HUD loans, but you first see the, uh, submit the blue bars or the seasonality or the, of the purchase market. Uh, every peak is the middle of summer. Every valley is the middle of winter. The run-up is the spring, and the tail is the fall. It's incredible how how uh, regular that, that actually is. Um, where you begin to see the pressure is when you see the refinance volume stacked on top of that going back six years. Those are the green bars. So it undulates on a variety of different reasons and for a variety of different influences. Meaningful to this slide and the data that we're intending to show is if you then look at the appraisers who are submitting that work, we tend to see about 40,000 regular names uh, submitting appraisals to the UCDP portal. That's less than the registered appraisers nationwide. There's credentials. Jim Park, our friend at uh, subcommittee, there's appraisers hold multiple credentials. So it would tend to inflate if we actually use the, the full appraiser count. But um, it does show the pressure going back into 2016 that where the green bars begin to pierce the capacity. It was, this is a na national view, but it was a real thing. It kind of trended back down. It manifests itself again in 2017, <clears throat> pardon me, and then again into 2018. So this is just 
part of the, the story that I think is important to tell. If you take that same data and you look at the appraisal count by appraiser and uh, trend that, you again see a blue line that's trending up, putting pressure on, kind of implying there's a greater valuation pie, greater valuation need across the appraiser's ability to be able, again, on this national view, to be able to support that. Again, just putting pressure on the current appraiser uh, capacity. It's important to note that this is in certain markets and certain submarkets at certain times. We had heard in 2016 that uh, it was coined the Cal State, COW, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington State, where my friend Bill King lives. It was, we're experiencing tremendous pressure, so that also got a look and a view for us. And you can see the data really supports the fact that in these areas, the markets were and still are beginning to experience pressure. Uh, Washington, you see some wild fluctuation, but again, the trend line is trending up. Same for Oregon. These are state views. Uh, I recently did a conference for Joan in Las Vegas, so we, we threw in a slide for Nevada, and this is quite a ride that the, uh, that the Nevada appraisers are experiencing. So, I think we have one more. So what's driving innovation? So we're, we, 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 continue, we are hearing and we're continuing to hear and see the, uh, the manifest pressure against appraisers. Um, it's coming not only relative to capacity concerns, but also to the amount, the sheer amount of uh, data, uh, big data and advanced analytics. Uh, we're moving towards a more data-driven, data-centric process. I think Adam touched on that as well. And we're beginning to see a lot of innovation outside of the first mortgage space, the primary market, but we're beginning to see a lot of innovation in the types of valuation products that are, that are being offered. So um, in addition to that, we have a lot of other overlays relative to what the retiring baby boom is going to put demands on the market, what the borrower of the future and the millennials on the front end are going to look like. Um, and so the pace of change is really exponential. Uh, there's a couple other things relative to um, innovation I don't have a slide on. As FHFA, our regulator, has um, handed both GSEs two fairly big, high-profile valuation-related scorecard objectives and initiatives. One is the uh, UAD redesign. UAD is a Uniform Appraisal Data Set redesign, also known as the Forms redesign. And the other initiative is uh, called APP, Appraisal Process and uh, Policy. It's really appraisal modernization. So pardon me. So both these initiatives are pretty significant if you're in the valuation space. Um, the form redesign is a joint initiative between ourselves and Fannie Mae. There's a, a big joint working team between both entities that's engaged on this. It's a three-year initiative relative to redesigning not redesigning the form, but redesigning the data set and the data standard that the GSEs will require. Um, the second initiative is the Appraisal Modernization Initiative. That was handed to both entities, Freddie and Fannie, individually and independently to work on. We're currently working on that, and that's also a multi-year effort. So when something gets escalated to a scorecard objective for the, uh, for the, uh, the GSEs from FHFA, it puts it on a cadence. We have quarterly deliverables, and it really raises the profile of the, of the topic. Uh, mentioned earlier was appraisal waivers, and um, we, again, like Fannie, we offer our appraisal waivers really at the far end of the uh, low end of the spectrum where there's lots of data um, as an alternative to uh, maybe relieving some of the appraisal pressure, not suggesting that's the only innovation card that, that either of us have to play, but I think it's a first step recognizing the amount of data, the big data and advanced analytics is out there that can help drive the process. So... Kind of rounding it off in terms of where the where does the appraiser fit, I think the first comes in um, some recognition that uh, the major changes in technology are really going to be the big hand in this process. Uh, to borrow an appraisal term, I think for, for me, I think it's a, not a determination of just sort of determining where the appraiser fits, but trying to be very thoughtful about where the appraiser actually provides the highest and best use in the process. Um, Adam touched on it earlier a little bit relative to kind of thinking about where we have opportunities to introduce uh, automation, 
uh, valuation models and maybe a blend of the boat, a blend of the two. Um, I can tend to think of, and I don't have a slide, um, but tend to think of valuation and valuation need across the spectrum. So I think it's helpful when you think about modernization and innovation that if you have that spectrum or continuum in mind, uh, far left end is high data, low risk, kind of migrating up to low data, high risk, and really what do we need to satisfy all those needs across that spectrum? Currently, we've had some AVM technology and waivers, and then on the far end, on the far right end, you got the 1004 Form 70 traditional URAR appraisal report form, and you could have a vast swath in between where there's a lot of opportunity for innovation. Um, up until recently, somewhat recently, the only card that anybody had to play was a 10470 across that entire space. So I think the pressure that we're going to feel and we're already beginning to feel is from data up, from big data up. So I think it's driving a more data-centric, data-driven process. Um, and if you think about it kind of high level, it makes sense. If you're, you've got great credit, you've got a re relatively low LTV demand on a loan, you're in a highly traded homogeneous market where the data is, you know, models and data can do a pretty good job narrowing in on value or what that valuation risk may represent in that loan transaction. As you migrate up in complexity, not just property complexity, with rural, more unique, more complex, you get in um, markets that the data is more difficult, you overlay more lend uh, borrower challenges, you're going to migrate up a, up a continuum where I candidly think you're always going to have some form, if not the current form, of the uh, appraisal process. So, in it, and I also feel that this doesn't necessarily have to be a battle between man or machine. I think it can be a nice blend as you begin to migrate up the spectrum where, you, where automation alone maybe can't solve or can't inform the process. You will likely have gradations of data with something. And then in the middle ground, you might have a nice data and appraiser combination that may be less than a full appraisal. And then again, there may be a place on the spectrum, and I tend to remain very bullish about the appraisal profession being an appraiser. Uh, I, I think there's going to be a place for appraisers. And there's going to be a place for a process that may look a lot like our current appraisal process. It's just likely not going to be across this entire spectrum going forward. So um, I get out in front of a lot of uh, appraisers and appraisal groups, industry groups, stakeholders, and constituents, particularly when I'm in front of appraisers, you know, kind of the next, the questions are, okay, what's next? What can we do? And I evangelize and advocate for the appraisers to stay engaged um, at whatever level, right? So understand that I think, you know, big data is here to stay, and as long as they can be a process, it be a part of the process for change, I think it could be, uh, could be very positive for the industry, so... That's the reality. All the hands are up, and I'll hand it back to Joan Trice. So. Thank you all. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I think I'm just going to throw it out to you guys uh, first. And um, I see Ed has a question. I'm shocked. Wheels are turning. I want to key off of something uh, you said, Ritesh. So yesterday I asked the question about the pro-cyclicality of AU and AVMs and, or ACEs, as you call them. And Ritesh, you talked about you can either be momentum-based or uh, uh, re reversion-based, and I call that price and value. Uh, and uh, pro-cyclical is the same as the momentum. And so if... The, the risk is that the ACE, and we, I think appraisals already are momentum-based by definition, and if all the ACE becomes is a faster, more efficient way to be momentum-based, we've not really solved the problem. We've made it, we've compounded the problem, and as we saw yesterday, what creates that momentum, particularly at the low end, is the leverage, which of course is provided by the government agencies largely. So, I, was, I mean, the question is for all, but um, how, how, do we, how do we deal with this? Because that's really the risk. We're just compounding the problem. And I'm a big fan of automated valuations, been using them and de developing them for years, but that's the risk is how do you make them not momentum-based? I think it has a lot to do uh, with controls, whether it's on the appraiser 
or on the AVM, as Ritesh showed you, as a blank slide. There are no controls. So uh, as much as I love data and technology, and I think there's just an amazing, exciting frontier in front of us, uh, there was a, a journalist uh, the other day, just a few days ago on CNBC, uh, talking uh, that every large technology company, just practically any enterprise today, needs a chief ethical officer. And that person needs to decide what they're going to do with this data and how it's going to be treated. So in, in places like Facebook, when you're compensating people on eyeballs, uh, you're going to get fake news. You're, you just created a, an engine to create fake news. So I think one of the pitfalls of AVMs is what you just said, Ed. It's a, it, it is potentially a weapon of math destruction. I mean, we're going to accelerate into a uh, crisis much faster uh, because all we've done is created a greater full theory and then hit the accelerator. So I'll, I'll let my panelists uh, comment as well well i mean there are models that will take you to destruction but there are also models that will help you stop the destruction so i think it starts with having standards so when you're getting an avm you should know this is a momentum based model that is hopefully not using mls data and uh, at the same time we can have models on the same on the same page that are cost-based. That's giving you a historical, it give you a historical spread. In this market, for example, in New York, a apartment uh, or a townhouse on, uh, in the Upper East Side will have a very large spread to replacement value. Same property, similar property, not the same property, in Las Vegas will have a much smaller spread to replacement value. And in New York, the replacement value is not really useful a unique property. In, in Las Vegas, it is. So having that available on the same page is, will give the appraiser a lot of information. It will give the reviewer, the underwriter, a lot of information. But we are not at the stage of having the conversation. We are still dealing with models that are, for lack of a better word, you know, they're bogus. So once you move past that to having real standards, then all this innovation in ABMs that is happening can be unleashed and can be made part of the appraisal process. And I would say from a risk perspective, I'd be thoughtful of maybe where these are going to be utilized, understanding that they're momentum based, they're going to, you know, they're going to be influenced. And, you know, my, I'm not a model or I'm not a data person per se. I understand there's there's it's it's a concern across all data that's consumed. You know, I I hear modelers and data say, well, the purest data is the buyer to seller transaction and that price. But I see Bill in the room and I think of the undisclosed concessions that may be behind that price that doesn't really necessarily make that data as consumed as pure. So, um, I, again, I, it may be an oversimplification, but I, I think a ta a, 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 across in, uh, this in terms of a, of a, a continuum or a spectrum of need and a spectrum of risk and really where it's appropriate to introduce these things. I think to your scenario, if you're at the highest end, highest risk, you're, you're, you know, whatever the loan characteristics are on that deal, if we're, anybody suggests that that should be some kind of an ABM or ACE or some sort of a, an automated valuation, that's, that's likely not the best spot for that. Sir. Understood, but it's also, right, I understand. Bill? Oh, sorry, Mark. Uh, Bill King. Uh, real info uh, or an AVM company. Uh, I have a few thoughts and uh, and a couple questions, uh, but I also have a flight at six o'clock this evening, so I may not get to them all. Um, well, you've only got a few minutes. Bill. Yeah, no, I, I, I realize that. Um, just a couple of comments or observations with the 1004, and I think one of the largest problems the 1004 created over time is that. Uh, it is the one tool that is in everybody's box, and when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And we've been trying to value a very broad spectrum of property types and, and, and geographies using that single tool, and I, I think that creates some problems trying to fit everything into that box. 
Um, I would also say, and, and I very much appreciate all of Ritesh's uh, perspectives, um, there are some responsible ways to use MLS data in AVMs. Uh, and I think that we have achieved that. Um, and I think many of the other AVM companies have as well. Uh, there is a lot of incentive that we have to, um, to, to be transparent and be objective, uh, because if I'm not, I'm going to lose in the competitive marketplace. Uh, so I've, I've got to be very uh, diligent about what we do. Um, insofar as the melding of appraisers and technology, I think that is the right direction. And again, going back to something Ritesh raised, uh, a phrase that I use often, all models are always wrong, uh, but some are useful. And it is the skilled practitioner that is the best at determining whether that model output is useful. The appraisal is a model. So um, it, it, the, we, we still need the eyes, ears, and, and feel of that skilled practitioner to l help us understand when the models are not working well and when alternative approaches need to be employed. So just my two bits. Mark? So I think, uh, so first of all, I think AVMs are at least theoretically do have a regulatory framework against them uh, that is required and that really starts with, uh, I'm gonna get wonky here, OCC 2016 interagency guidance for model validation which is if you're regulated by the OCC, the OTS, and a federally regulate, and the Fed, uh, that was in 2000, um, that there was a very specific set of ways in which you should validate models that, were that you were using for risk decisions. Uh, under Dodd-Frank, that was updated. I think it was OCC Interagency 2016. Um, and in there, um, again, if you were a regulated bank, it was, now it was not only validation, but also model governance. And then phraseology for if you're using third-party models, you're not off the hook for the validation and the governance of those models, which basically is a pass-through to, say, an AVM provider to say, you know, you need to at least provide sufficient information to that banking institution so that they can do the sufficient level of governance and val validation. So there is framework there. Um, I think the challenge is, well, one, uh, you know, the de minimis rule on the use of AVMs, it basically says, you know, anything other than appraisal is very limited to basically, I think it's $216,000 or something like that, which basically puts you out of most of the traditional purchase or refi business and sticks you in HELOC home equity land for the use of an AVM in a risk to predicate your transaction for the determination of risk. There is one carve out that says, or whatever Fannie and Freddie say they'd like to do, right? Um, so my question after that long-winded task is, you know, realistically the AVMs are, uh, you know, are not used for risk management by banks because of the de minimis task and therefore the regulation on them, although the OCC does regulate and ask for testing where they use listings-based models with a 95% PP10. Come on, housing is more heterogeneous. You showed as examples. There's no way a computer can be that good. There's no way a human can even be that good. Um, but the question then becomes, maybe this is really a question to you, Scott. Well, we're using AVMs within, and Fannie and Freddie, the collateral underwriting process to waive the requirement of an appraisal. If we were to sort of apply the regulatory guidance of model validation and governance, although your regulator is not the OCC or the other interagency partners, what is FHFA doing around the application of something similar around validation and governments, governance? of AVMs at Fannie and Freddie because they are being used through the waiver process for risk decisions. Right, so I'm gonna artfully dodge the question by telling you that in, uh, so for appraisal, valuation, collateral, where I sit, um, obviously I, I'm, I'm aware of, then we have a uh, you know, model governance process at Freddie Mac, the, our regulator has oversight. Uh, the tool, the ACE tool is not just an AVM, it's a component of a lot of algorithms and models that run. So I would say at a high level, there, there is oversight, and, but I can't speak directly to maybe a lot of detail around that. Question? Uh, Kevin Park with HUD. Um, 
to me, the, the problem with using the listing data in the AVM is not the inherent that it, it because it does provide information, particularly when they're, they're uh, doing the average price to listing discounts of all the thing that the, the ways that you could reasonably use it is that it means that you have no way of validating the accuracy of the AVM for non-purchase transactions. It's the refinances and the reverse mortgages. But at the same time, the appraiser gets access to the contract price and all the terms of the contract. And so is there any reason, <laughs> if you're going to allow them to do that, should the AVMs also, or should we not allow the, the appraiser to have the contract? I think they both should be independent, to be perfectly honest. Um, they, they shouldn't have disparate treatment. Um, but, you know, it, it is a loss of information. I mean, it, it is. Yeah, so, that, that's the argument for the other side. Right. So I've, I've got a whole hour on this, but I'll <laughs> condense it down. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, structural impl implications to what you suggest. So per use path now, uh, the appraisers have to or required to uh, review the contract to the um, undisclosed conditions or fees that would influence that amount that's set significant. And I think from a, from a um, giving the answer to the test kind of component to the contract review, which we hear a lot, I think that's also another structural problem. We're, getting, we're, we're asking the appraisers the wrong question. Basically, appraisers are reconciling to a range, and in a purchase transaction, that's another data point. If they see it's within the range, they're generally going to tend to call uh, the, the, the value opinion at or near that number. Um, if they miss it a little bit, they realize they're, gonna, they're inviting a lot of torture and rework and resubmission to say, you're $2,000 off the Smith loan and, and, and what have you. So um, I think there's, I'm going to kind of position off of your question. I think there's ways we can be thoughtful about that, but I don't know without a lot of structural heartburn. I don't know how we, I don't know if you've. Opinions on that, but. I mean, there, are, there are two very fundamental problems with using MLS data in a model. So first of all, you know, with due apologies to my esteemed colleagues, there are, I think, multiple folks here who build really good AVMs. Um, we all have to go and use MLS data if you have to be commercially viable. Because there's somebody out there saying, my model is 95%, and if yours is at 70, you're, not, you're being honest, but you're being commercially unviable. The second fundamental problem is the benchmark to an AVM is purchase transactions, period. There's no other way to test an AVM. If you are looking at the MLS, which is in most markets a few percent off the actual sale price, then you're looking at the answers to the test before you go to the test. So it effectively destroys any way of independently benchmarking AVMs. Secondly, when you use that data, I would argue that an AVM should also give you an independent, objective opinion of value. Once you use that data, you're bringing in the realtor's opinion of what this home will sell for. And you're underwriting a loan that, let's say the home sold, you're underwriting a loan which is close to what the home sold for based on that price. So it's no longer independent. You're basically echoing back what the realtor said the home should sell for. And it's sold. So it makes this whole enterprise very hollow. And, and even honest AVMs that actually perform pretty well on refis have to go and use this data. And the bad AVMs that will really crash on refis look good. So you, cannot, you can no longer separate the, the, the wheat from the chaff. And, and it just makes the whole enterprise meaningless. To, to the gentleman's question real quick, if we could solve it, um, I think Dr. Nakamura's study in the Philly Fed talked about the information loss, right? So if you're reconciling at or on the purchase price all the time because of all that, you know, just the, 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 the developmental process, if, you, if the appraiser was free to reconcile to a range or the, on the other side, if underwriters were able to underwrite to some other point value to establish the LTV, which, which translates through the rest of the loan, then I think there would be information gain and seeing what that differential is, and um, also to determine the modelers inside of our company say, you know, they get concerned with the near misses, that there may be some signaling out of the appraisal community, that, that there may be another message behind that message. So I think it would be a tremendous information gain if we could be thoughtful about it. I just don't know candidly how to do it. I think we need to be intellectually honest about the entire valuation process. I mean, so... 
Human beings can be pressured to produce an inflated value, and certainly HUD uh, has done a study, a very recent one, that uh, in their HECM loans are experiencing some serious heartburn on overvaluations. Uh, a, a model um, uh, is subject to the same bias. So let me tell you a little story. A friend of mine was an early AVM modeler, and he sold his uh, company off to a large enterprise. And so in the go-go early 2000s, uh, they came to him and they said, um, you got to juice our model in Florida. Well, you know, cascades are all the rage now. And our model isn't getting enough hits. So they only get compensated when their model along the cascade gets a hit. So a loan officer would go to the first model, ooh, I don't like that value. Then they go to the second one until they finally got one with the answer that they were looking for. So if he juiced his model, they were asking him, I think, something to do something in the 7% a month range in Florida, uh, then they could make a lot of money. And so he no longer, he, his tenure at that uh, company uh, was short-lived after he uh, refused to do that. Um, so human beings write algorithms. Uh, human beings are so, so both need controls. So how do you get to independence? I think that's the real question. I think the other thing, the cautionary tale on models, the present models are sale price models. They are misnomers. They are not valuation models. They're sale price models. The, you're supposed to be lending on market value, not sale price. So there are three approaches to value. You could develop a model that had three approaches to value. A human being, an appraiser, properly trained, should be developing three approaches to value. But we have policy and other things that have completely, in my opinion, destroyed the very foundation that valuation is based upon. So we need to go back to fundamentals, and I think we do, as Scott said, we need to merge man and machine. So where it really gets exciting is if you think about uh, ways if you all are familiar with the app Waze uh, Traffic, mm -hmm. um, it is a great mapping app where human beings in real time respond. Oh, there's a pothole on 4th and Main. Avoid that area. Uh, if you just use Google Maps or Apple Maps, you, you, you would hit the pothole. Or there's an accident at this intersection. So that's what an appraiser can do. So... When you saw Adam's pictorial, how does, an, how does an AVM know that there's a jail in the basement of a, of a property? Um, it doesn't. Condition is a huge factor on the valuation. And it's not just square footage and sticks and bricks that a machine can measure. It's does the house have a good functional quality or you know is it architecturally attractive those kind of things that I've yet to see a machine say yeah that's a pretty house or that's an ugly house so we still I think human judgment is highly underrated I do John the key word is yet to see excuse me yet to see yet to see yeah uh, any other Thank you. If I may, um, Scott and Adam, are your presentations available? I didn't see them in what was handed out, and I'm wondering if you're making them available to us. So typically, uh, Freddie does not release, Okay. although I picked up Sam's out there earlier from yesterday, so I'll be happy to check. So. Okay, and Adam, same case, uh, corporately, uh, preclude uh, making if, that available? If there was uh, significant enough demand. Then I could petition for it to be released. 
Okay, and then I have just a very briefly a second question. It's really directed to you, Scott. Over the years of attending these, there have been a lot of complaints about the siloing of appraisal data that is done at Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Is that still the case? Have there been any changes? And are there discussions as to making this data more widely available for the modelers and others? So the short answer is yes. Um, the quick quip is you must have been at the last appraisal conference because that's a, been a constant theme and a question. And um, I think, to my point of view, Tom, I think it's an important element of modernization is beginning to share some element of data back with the, the particularly the appraisal community. It's ridiculous now that we've got all this data and we can't share elements of it back. I, I, I comprehend that historically there's always been some, some uh, reticence to give too much data and we need to be thoughtful about the type of data. I think if we get to the point where here's a list of comps, here's your best comps, here's a suggested adjustment that we just create an echo chamber of just There'll be appraisers out there who will do nothing more than get under the, the GSE bar. So we want to still you know, be able to consume uh, properly developed and supported credible appraisals. A long answer to your question is I think there's a degree of data that we, we could be thoughtful about sharing up front that won't bias that process. Um, there are a lot of communities, Atlanta had it, Cincinnati had it at a time where and there's other communities I'm sure where appraisers actually opt in as a, as, a, as a database and share, if you will, the front page data of their appraisal. So it's, it's just a data share that they all contribute to that if I'm developing an appraisal and I want to use a comp of a house you just appraised, I would have a high reliance in all that, if you will, that property DNA data that you captured, room count, size, condition, quality, lot. I mean, everything else, all the elements of that property over and above, with all due respect to our realtor friends, maybe even the, the MLS data. So um, to me, that kind of helps inform maybe part of the need. So hopefully we can be, that can be a, maybe a first step of what we could share back. Well, can, I, can I mention Lynn, yeah. one thing? We hear a lot of talk about value, and we really all tend to be operating under the same definition. We're talking about mortgage lending, and that's a most probable sale price. Property is placed in the exposed to the open market for a reasonable period of time. Buyer and seller are each equally motivated uh, to act in their own best interest. Price is made in terms of cash or financing comparable thereto. So this is the definition that's been enshrined in law. It's been enshrined in guideline. And so everyone tends to be operating. So if that's the definition we're using, then everyone's going to try to model to that, which is why you hear all these panelists coming back, the same thing, sale price, sale price, sale price, because the definition of market value currently says the most probable sale price. There are other definitions of value out there, and there's nothing that really prevents us from redefining value for the purpose of mortgage lending. Uh, we do have some European counterparts who have value mm -hmm. concepts such as long-term lending value. Yep. Um, which kind of which 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 serves to take away some of the the, the high peaks and lows and, and smooth out uh, the curve a bit as 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 all of you likely know a value today is not necessarily a value tomorrow we tend to like to think things go up from a mortgage lending perspective uh, the loss curve may occur when the value is is at a low as opposed to a high um, so when we're when you're really modeling out what's loan to value look like, it isn't it isn't linear, but but uh, if you're going to take take that amplification out from the ups and downs, then you would then you're essentially trying to make value look linear, um, which may be a fine thing to do if you're trying to. But that's a form of manipulation. That's actually not market behavior. That would be influence behavior. That would be a government influence behavior that says. I'm going to serve to constrict the market and basically uh, avoid properties being able to have a high run-up up beyond their, fund their long-term fundamentals. So property values that tend to rise, absent fraud, property values that tend to rise very rapidly are oftentimes rising because of some fundamental driver. Um, the market will self-correct. Uh, the problem is when it self-corrects, it can correct significantly down, which is what we saw in the crisis. Um, so the questions that we ask ourselves are more structural, and that is, should there be some sort of artificial constraint on free market behavior? 
If there is, then you tend to smooth out those ups and downs and the losses and the foreclosures that happen when people have to abandon because they're upside down in their property and they need to move. Um, you, you would smooth it out, but you would also then, you'd create that, that artificial boundary. So that's more of a policy or a philosophical question. Um, and then if we go simply to an institutional level, there's a difference here. An institution can model for losses and say, you know what, the property with the jail, how many properties do you think have jails in them? Right? So while we can say, well, the AVM would really blow it on that one probably, right? probably wouldn't be anywhere near its real sell price. Um, how many properties have jails? So you could say, you know what, if that's one out of every 10,000 properties as a jail, I can price for that. I could, I could be wrong on that one. And in the midst, I'll save, you know, $22 million in fees, right? Um, so you'd say, I'll take that trade off all day long. But at an individual level, an individual buyer level, we're saying at an institutional level I can price for it, but at an individual buyer level, if a valuation is also supposed to serve to protect the individual, then it wouldn't be a good concept to say, I'll take that risk simply because I can price it in on a book of business. To the individual, it matters. To the person who overpays for a property and is actually at 120 LTV instead of the 95 they thought, they're, they're personally in a bad circumstance. So that, that's, that's one of the tensions that exists in the market today. I said a lot, but said yeah. absolutely nothing. Lynn, did you have a question? I um, wanted to see if there were any ideas from the panelists about uh, an issue Scott raised a moment ago, which you talked about the information loss, right? If we're reconciling to this, this point estimate, um, and to Joan's point about the human factor in the field, is there some way to create incentives to get, to create a positive feedback loop on improving the information? Right, so you send an appraiser out with this information, they find that some of it's not correct. It's gonna take a lot of effort to justify a different condition. So there's a couple of recent papers out there where two appraisals in the same house, you know, within three months of each other and the physical condition of the property is dramatically different between the two. Right. Um, so if information's valuable to you and it's gonna take effort in the field to fix the information, how do you somehow create a compensation scheme that might Take it Be a virtuous quick. loop. It's a great question, and uh, I'll evangelize a little bit for the UAD redesign, the new data set, right, and the new data standard. So I think that is going to help uh, empower appraisers and provide them the appropriate data that they're going to need, boots on the ground, if you will, when they're collecting data on a property so that we can accurately, adequately not only capture those from a condition and quality perspective, It'll enable and give the appraiser the ability to develop a more credible report, but also from an information perspective, we'll actually have that. So right now, on the any appraisers in the room know we we the GSEs you know uh, on the reporting standard require a C and a Q rating, a condition and a quality rating, and there's a whole list of one through six of what these mean, and we require the appraiser from a practical standpoint now to go in a home and balance and capture informally quality of the condition, the HVAC, the, all the elements that make up a home and then roll it up into one adjustment based on his or her kind of, you know, opinion, experience, whatever. Um, going forward, we'll hopefully be able to capture all those data elements and hopefully it, would, it will allow less data loss. And if we can be thoughtful about any policy implications to maybe how that value is reported going forward, maybe we'll have all that information and lead to less bad behaviors by appraisers. There's some that are just gonna do the minimum of what they need to do. Um, some appraisers don't utilize the contract amount just as an additional data point. They use it as a goal. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, from a, from a data and a modeling perspective, that would be tremendous to have that, that kind of clean up in the data and have a little bit more peer view into that. So that's my two cents. quality and condition as well? I think no doubt to a degree. So, so one, one view that we have is, is a classical view of AI that it will supplant the human being. And that's a common fear going back hundreds of years. But what actually ends up happening is it becomes more of augment. It augments the human being. So in our view, the, the ideal outcome is where the appraiser starts the appraisal process by looking at an AVM valuation, and it is a somewhat 
adversarial approach where the appraiser says the AVM is wrong because of this reason, because there's a jail cell in the basement. And that, that process actually includes an information loop because now the appraiser is correcting the, the AVM. And, and there's a common, common uh, conception that because housing is heterogeneous, you cannot accurately model it. But you have models out there, for example, self-driving cars, they're driving on streets. Literally everyone is unique. Every single, uh, every single moment in the car's process is unique. So heterogeneity has never been a barrier to models given enough data. So how do we create a positive information loop is to bring the appraiser in, start with the AVMs, and the, the, the appraiser is now saying the model is wrong because it doesn't know that the water body next to the house is not a water body, it's a swamp, or it's a you know, toxic dump. And that process actually can draw information back into, 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 into the data set. To add on to that point real quick and to your point, Lynn, I think we're starting to see it in technology. It's been a while since I've been in the field to do an appraisal, but I understand from practicing appraisers now, a lot of these inbound orders come with a lot of data that really is the intent is for the, the appraiser to interact with it, not just take it as wrote. To your point, if, if you know, if on Adam's jail cell assignment, if it came and it was dramatically different, the appraiser on their pad, phone, whatever, they can just go through and they're overriding like crazy. It might be the first time we've seen that property, but that is a great opportunity to collect that data. So, All right, folks. Well, I think we're out of time, and I'm going to leave you with um, thinking about what you would like next year, our valuation uh, panel, to uh, talk about. So uh, we'd love your feedback. So thank you.